The Dome is closed inside the Sky Dome at Toronto. That's the view. ESPN Sunday Night Baseball goes to Canada. The Baltimore Orioles meeting the Toronto Blue Jays. The Blue Jays are hot even though the weather has cooled off in Toronto. The Red Sox are also cooling off. And now with a victory tonight, as you can see, Toronto will move to within just one game of first place Boston. Hello, everyone. This is John Miller along with Joe Morgan. We're very happy to have you with us. And I think we've got quite a ball game for you. The first three ball games of this series, real hard played, and the Blue Jays were lucky to win any of them, much less two of them. Two straight nights coming from two runs down in the bottom of the ninth inning, uh, really bucking the odds in that one. They've got the power, though, to do things like that with McGriff, Gruber, George Bell. Well, I think last year most people remember George Bell rose to the occasion and almost single handedly led the Blue Jays to the division title. This year is going to have to come from someplace else. George Bell is struggling a little bit with his vision. It's going to have to come from Kelly Gruber or McGriff. And I think both of these guys are able to rise to the occasion. Kelly Gruber did so last night, and I think you'll see a lot of McGriff down the stretch. This Baltimore club trying to rise to the occasion here in Toronto, the sight of their being defeated and losing the divisional title the final weekend last year, and the Ripken brothers yesterday each hitting homers in the same inning, giving Baltimore the lead, but they couldn't hold it. Well, I think Baltimore wants to be spoilers. They came in here thinking about last year. They don't, you don't ever forget that, that the Blue Jays knocked you out last year. They wanted to spoil the Blue Jays' chances this year, and they really played well enough to do so. It's just been a little common of a couple of things. The Blue Jays have been a little lucky and they've had some clutch hitting by guys coming off the bench as well as Kelly Gruber in the clutch. Cito Gaston has said tonight before the game, hey, we easily could have lost each of the first three games of this series. So we've got the Orioles and the Blue Jays coming up from indoors in the Sky Dome and the matchups, usually a reliever, Frank Wills for Toronto, the 11 game winner, Dave Johnson for the Orioles. John Miller and Joe Morgan back at the Sky Dome in Toronto where the roof is closed. Indoor baseball. Now this year's diehard starting lineup for the visiting Baltimore Orioles. It'll be Steve Finley leading it off in right field. Brady Anderson hits second in left field. Cal Ripken is at shortstop as usual. Sam Horn bats cleanup the designated hitter. Craig Worthington hits fifth. He's at third base. Mickey Tentleton is the catcher batting sixth. Mike Devereaux plays center field. The rookie switch hitting David Segui is at first base and Bill Ripken bats ninth at second base. Felix in right Wilson in center field Ducey in left Gruber's at third Fernandez is the shortstop Lee is at second but Griff is at first base Myers will do the catching and on the mound right hander Frank Wills. Wills is 31 years of age and uh, ordinarily a relief pitcher but now working in the rotation because of the ineffectiveness of left handed John Cerruti and in his three starts the Blue Jays have won uh, two times. Well I, I think you know they've had to go to a couple of guys bringing them out of the bullpen they had a strong bullpen at the beginning of the season and I think that's one of the reasons that they were contending so well and in first place for a while. I think when they started bringing guys out of the bullpen it weakened their bull, bullpen made their starting staff a little stronger but it weakened their bullpen and they've suffered a little bit from that. So Wills who will turn 32 in October a former punter out of Tulane University he's been around a long long while one of these fellows who's made it seems just about every stop along the way and he has no overnight sensation. He was the winner here on the final Saturday of the season against Baltimore out of uh, the bullpen when they clinched the pennant. The Sky Dome as you see is very much one ballpark when the roof is closed as it is tonight. And when the roof is open it's tough to hit home runs here almost three home runs a game when the roof is closed the ball carries awfully well. Well I I, I think this is a good ballpark but watching it the guys hit balls in batting practice they were flying out of here. And when this place first opened everyone felt like this was going to be tough a tough park to hit home runs in. It's turned out to be just the opposite. Sky Dome a symmetrical ballpark. 328 feet actually down the, the lines in left and right 375 to the power alleys and 400 feet to straightaway center field which doesn't begin to tell you about the Sky Dome which is uh, certainly a marvel the Sky Dome you see out in center field beyond the 400 foot sign above that a Glaston area that's a huge restaurant just above that is a, an open air bar where you can uh, purchase a bar stool overlooking center field and the ball game for fifteen hundred dollars a year on a season ticket basis. There's the bar the folks up there 
enjoying themselves. It's kind of a unique vantage point to to watch a ball game. This is the 21st century answer to those houses across the street on Waveland Avenue and Sheffield Avenue at Wrigley Field, Joe. Well, this is a beautiful ballpark, no doubt about it. I think the screen in center field is a, it's like sitting at home watching on television. Very it, clear. It's it's amazing. So here is Steve Findlay, a man who has been uh, doing his best hitting of the season the last uh, month to six weeks. He's hit 362 the last 18 games. Wills, like many relief pitchers, always works from the stretch, and we're underway. There is ball one. I can't understand why he would do that for nine innings though or <laughs> usually a relief pitcher works from the stretch because when he comes into a ball game that's the situation he's in with men on base. He says he just feels he has better control and feels more comfortable because that's his uh, usual position when he pitches There's ball two. And uh, on the other hand Cito Gaston says once he gets up around 70 75 pitches he's out of there anyway. They still Although he's in the rotation look at him as a reliever making some starts so five six innings probably is all they can hope for from Wills that's what they've been getting from him. three and all oh the count to Steve Finley Baltimore a year ago came into Toronto the final weekend of the season and it was between the Jays and the Orioles for the American League East the Orioles were the surprise team in baseball then Toronto won the first two games of that series to clinch it and each time as Finley takes a strike the Blue Jays came from behind in the eighth inning when they were being trailing in the ball game and eventually won those ball games. Now talk about history repeating itself for that man Cito Gaston in each of the last two days a year later the Blue Jays trailing in the ninth inning each time by two runs and they come back to win. Ball four to Finley. Well, the Orioles have been playing them tough but that's been the difference between the Orioles of this year and last year anyway. They've been losing a lot of those close ball games losing a lot of ball games in the late innings. They've always been a base hit short. They've been maybe one pitch short of ending a would be rally for the other team. One great catch in the outfield short. Here is Brady Anderson. Finley the Orioles leading base dealer. He's over at first base. Brady Anderson also a speedster hitting 242 as you see. That's to McGriff. Nice pickup. Fernandez can't get the ball out of his glove. He had Wills covering it first. Brady pretty tough to double up anyway on a 3-6-1 type double play. So they get the lead man. Finley at second base. That was a nice play by McGriff. He gave Fernandez a good throw at second. He first had to come up with a tough hop. But he made a good double play. Attempt at a double play anyway. He started it very nicely. Watch. He comes off the bag very quickly. He's in position. That's a tough hop. Good throw to second. Oh, and Fernandez just could not get it out of his glove. It's good view. Shows you what McGriff does right there on the bag. But Fernandez actually was in very poor position to receive the ball as well. And uh, Brady Anderson, who also has some speed, 10 stolen bases. He's been caught only twice. Brady suffered a serious ankle sprain earlier in the year, however, that put him on the shelf for a while and also. Limited his uh, running ability for a while after he came back. Cal Ripken, he hit a home run yesterday. Been slumping, however, in September. And it brings up the old argument about has he played too many ball games the last few years and does he need some time off? And again, I think only Ripken can answer that. And his answer is no. Well, that that tells me he says he's a 250 hitter then. <laughs> There goes Brady. Pitch outside. Throw to second by Myers. Heath! The 11th steal for Brady Anderson. Anderson had a good jump at first base. And the throw was there. It was a little high, but it was there. So he has one foot on the carpet, which means he had a good lead. Got a good jump. The throw was just a little high. And by the time Fernandez gets the tag on him, he's safe. Catcher comes out very well. If the throw is a little lower, I think they get him, but you can see he has to bring the ball all the way down, and by the time he gets it there, the runner is safe. There goes Brady again. Pitch taken for a ball. And into left field. He gets up, and he'll score. Here comes the throw in too late from Ducey. Fernandez backing up the play, and had he been able to catch that ball, 
Brady Anderson didn't realize what had happened at first. I think Brady might not have scored. Uh, the pitcher has to take the blame for this play. He did not hold Anderson at all at second base and Anderson took off. The catcher saw that he had to rush so he threw the ball too quickly and threw it away. See he's going right there. Catcher has to rush it. Good job by Ripken by not moving out of the way as well. So one out and nobody on. And the one one pitch to Cal Ripken is ball two. So Brady Anderson steals two bases. And scores on the throwing error charged to Myers the catcher. One to nothing Orioles. Now this was the. The basic blueprint for the Orioles these last couple of years Joe increased speed manufacture runs but it hasn't been there so much for them. This is a bit misleading. This is not the way it's gone much of the year for them. Well that's the reason that they have not been a real serious challenge to the Toronto Blue Jays. Two and two. As I mentioned he had a great jump. Anderson did it from second base. The throw was not nearly in time as you could see. Gruber tried to block it but no chance and of course Anderson finally realized the ball had gone into the outfield got up and scored the first run of the ball game. Two and two meanwhile to Cal Ripton's Brady back to that's Tom McCraw his hitting instructor. Talking something over. Two two pitch to Cal. Ball three. Three and two the count. On deck is Sam Horn. Cal Ripken has done well against Wills the few times he's faced him and many of the Orioles have. But Wills had that one very fine performance in relief in that final weekend of last year to beat them. The day they clinched the pennant. Clinched the division anyway. Cal is down on strikes. Well Wills just throws a fastball by Calvin Cal Ripken on the inside part of the plate. And Ripken can't handle it. And that's one of the reasons one of the things I've seen from Ripken in the last few months is that he doesn't handle a ball on the inside part of the plate as well as he did you know a couple of years ago. And it's funny he used to stand much further off the plate. He's moved in on the plate now and he doesn't handle that ball in as well either and which is the opposite of the way you would think he would go. But here's Sam Horn. Now he has been hitting the ball well. He bounces one foul. Interesting. Nine days ago. Reggie Jackson was in town televising a game for the Angels back to Southern California. He went up to Sam Horn says I've been watching you trying to pull everything. You're six five two fifty. You just have to make hard contact. You could hit home runs to left left center anywhere. Pull the off speed pitches but just go with what they take it concentrate on making hard contact. That's a high soaring fly ball. Ducey with an easy play. And Horn is retired. Well, Horn that night hit a double off the left field wall and a three run homer over the left field wall. And he's been doing that ever since and has had great success, including a grand, grand slam here the other day. Again, back at the Sky Dome in Toronto. It's cool outside in the low 50s, Fahrenheit. Very nice indoors. Now this year's Die Hard starting lineup for the Toronto Blue Jays. It'll be the veteran Mookie Wilson in center field. Tony Fernandez is at shortstop. Kelly Gruber bats third at third base. Fred McGriff is at first base. It'll be George Bell the designated hitter not able to play the outfield right now. Rob Ducey instead in left field. It'll be Greg Myers back of the plate batting seventh. Manny Lee at second base and Junior Felix hits ninth in right field. And the Baltimore defense has Steve Finley in right. Devereaux is in center field. Brady Anderson in left. Greg Worthington's at third. Cal Ripken is at shortstop. Billy Ripken at second base. David Segui is the first baseman. Mickey Telton does the catching and on the mound. Right hander Dave Johnson. And this fellow is a, a hometown hero, a guy who played for eight or nine years in the minor leagues and never gave up hope and then finally got a look with his hometown team, the Baltimore Orioles, and he is their biggest winner this year. Uh, I would think that you'd have a lot of pressure on your pitching in your hometown. I know a lot of players do not like to play in their hometown even though they grew up there saying well hey there's a lot of pressure family friends etc when you, you have to answer to too many people when you don't do the job but of course Dave Johnson has done the job so it hasn't been a problem for him. Well Johnson seems to to fit the town very well as uh, he's a, not only a Baltimorean but a guy who in the off season to support his family he drove a truck and he did whatever kind of a job he could get to pay the bills and when he came to the big leagues last year he was living in a trailer park. They had a, a small trailer but prosperity has hit. In the big leagues now they bought a home this past winter. 
And there's a, a ball. He seems to thrive on it, though. He goes to every function. He goes to every church group, every synagogue. If there's uh, four more people who want to sit and talk Orioles baseball in the winter, Dave Johnson will be there. That's a strike. Mookie Wilson. He was one of the key figures in the stretch for the Jays last year. And again this year, he's hitting awfully well. You see right there. And uh, this one is caught by Brady Anderson, although it looked like he was fighting the lights, perhaps. One away, and that'll bring up Fernandez. Now, there is the Sky Dome Hotel in which we have been quartered uh, during our stay here. And there are many rooms that overlook the field. You get a, a hotel room for the television. And if there's one scheduled, a ball game. Yeah. Have a few friends in the Sky Dome Hotel. And they've got, uh, I don't know if it's one of the great views of the, the ball game, but it's sort of a, a novelty. Well, it's definitely a novelty. I don't know if I would like to watch a baseball game from the hotel room. Well, what would you like to do? I'd like to sit out here in front of all these people and sit in the stands, you peanuts, popcorn, and get in, be part of the live action. Fernandez with a fly ball to left, and uh, Brady Anderson has a little less trouble with this one. Out number two. And then the batter will be yesterday's hero, Kelly Gruber. Dave Johnson is not really a hard thrower. But he does a lot of little things well to help himself. He rarely walks a hitter, stays ahead of hitters. And when a base dealer gets on base, Dave Johnson has been the toughest, at least in the American League, to get a jump against. Nobody even tries to steal against Dave Johnson. Well, he has that slide step, so he gets the ball to the plate pretty quickly. Now here's Gruber. You see his 104 RBIs. Ball one. Johnson pitched the final Saturday last year and led into the eighth inning three to one although he was not supposed to have started. He had lost his spot in the rotation late in the season. Pete Harnish was supposed to go but the night before walking from the Sky Dome back to the team hotel they weren't staying at the Sky Dome Hotel. He stepped on a nail couldn't make the start the next day. Dave Johnson got the call and pitched a beauty foul ball. Two and one. The Orioles are ahead here, one nothing. They, in effect, they stole a run. Brady Anderson with a couple of steals and scoring in an error by Myers. One nothing Orioles. Frank Robinson, what a difference a year makes. Manager of the year last year, and this year the Orioles are taking their lumps. Two and one, the count. And Johnson throws a little curveball, uh, but he says Joe he throws maybe 70, 75 percent fastballs during the course of a game. Well, as long as you can spot it and pitch it, pitch to the hitter's weakness, I think that's the best pitch. I'm still a fan of the fastball. Has a drive deep in the left field. This one has a chance, and Gruber has done it again. Off the facade of the second deck, it's all tied up. Well, Kelly Gruber has been very hot lately. I talked to him before the ball game, and he said he's swinging a bat very well now. And this is a fastball on the inside part of the plate, and once he turns on it, he can see it's gone. Right on the inside corner from our overhead view. And Kelly Gruber just drives it out. Watch how he keeps the good balance. You can draw a line from his head right down through the rest of his body. That means he stayed, kept his balance right below him. Now here's another home run hitter Fred McGriff with a 304 batting average 34 home runs. He led the league last year in homers. Two and oh the count. Well yesterday the Gruber hit the game winning home run on a 2 0 -oh pitch that was up a fastball. This one was uh, up a little bit as well. Well I, I think as I mentioned before it's going to be up to Kelly Gruber and I think Fred McGriff the guy that's hitting now for these two guys to get hot and that would be a perfect situation because you have a left hander and a right hander. Three and zero to McGriff on deck is the slumping George Bell. Last year McGriff, remember, could not do anything in September with the bat. Swings away on three and zero. Tentleton will 
not be able to get to it. It's in amongst the spectators. Three and one. McGriff had only one home run the whole final month of the year. This year, he's already hit six in about half a month in September with a 3.39 average. So I at least his numbers are good in September. Well, I think you grow it with experience, and he, he has been through a pennant race now. I think he's more relaxed in this position. And it takes a time, some experience before you know how you're going to react. Sometimes you go into a situation trying too hard, and I think that's what happened to him last year. I think he's a lot more relaxed this year, and he's swinging the bat a lot better. Three and one to McGriff. Two down, a run in. He curved him. Strike two, full count. McGriff, a pull hitter. You see the Orioles' infield defense. Worthington's almost over to short. Cal Ripken in shallow center, and Bill Ripken is out in shallow right center, the second baseman. 3 2 pitch. Curved him again. And he lost it. And Johnson wonders where that one was. Well, the ball was definitely inside. It starts over the inside part of the plate and it breaks off the corner. It's inside all the way. Get an overhead view. You can see the ball is inside. Catcher tries to pull it back. You didn't think it caught that little corner no, there? No, it was inside. <laughs> was it on the black? <laughs> no. Black is a ball anyway, if it's on the black. That's a ball. McGriff over at first, and here's George Bell. I like that shot, that center field camera. I mean, the one up on the rooftop. The one in straightaway center field that we're used to, this shot that we're looking at right now, is not online and it tends to distort things a little bit and that sh that camera up above this the, up in the middle of the dome is supposedly set up so that it looks right down on home plate it's supposed to be centered and looking right down on the plate to the top of the dome here is 31 stories you could fit the Astrodome inside of this ball, but you could fit any of the other dome stadiums right inside of this place. To me, it doesn't really look any larger than the Astrodome. It does the other dome. It looks bigger than the other domes, but it doesn't look any larger. Maybe it's just because they have the restaurants and the other things in center field. One ball, one strike to George Bell. Everything here is built in such a grand scale because I had that same sensation, Joe. And I think that is what is the reason for that everything is gigantic in here it all looks like it's right on top of you but it is huge two and one to Bell actually 32 stories to the top of the roof outside you could fit a 31 story building right inside here the tallest building in Baltimore is 31 stories tall two and one and a pop foul that comes back out of play plus Joe I think you saw the Astrodome when it first opened, you were just a young kid. Things always look big when you're a kid. <laughs> well, driving into Toronto last night, I, I didn't think that this was, it just didn't look that large to me. And I guess it still doesn't. And as you say, everything is built to the same scale, so it looks like it's right on top of you. It looks smaller. I have another theory on that. What is that? Well, you're in the Hall of Fame now. The whole world looks small to you. <laughs> no, no. The world is your oyster now, Joe. Not quite. <laughs> How about having them open up the Empire State Building for me some night and I can take a tour? Just call them. This is a Harvard education. Off the fist, and no. Sagi can't get to it. I mean, that was way off the fist. That might have hit him on the thumb. George Bell's bat seems to be slow. That's. I was watching him take a few swings in batting practice, and everything seems to be slow. The George Bell that the Toronto Blue Jays know and love really can handle the inside fastball. You can see he's really late on that. And he's trying to push it off of him. He's usually turning on that pitch. Bell is in one of his worst slumps ever right now. It's a tie ball game, one to one, two down, runner at first. We're in the first. Dave Johnson to George Bell. Foul off to the right. This is George Bell, a normal George Bell, when he's swinging the bat as well as he's capable of. You know, the place to pitch him is away and up a little bit. He handles the inside pitch very well, as you can see. Right now, he seems to be very vulnerable to the inside pitch, and he has not had an extra base hit since August 9th, which I think would point out to me that he is not does not have the same bat speed that he normally has, and he's not handling the ball middle of the plate in as he normally does. 
He struck him out. So the slump continues for George Bell who has not hit a home run since August the second. And he has not even had an extra base hit a double or a triple since August the ninth. Amazing. It's all tied up one one at the end of one. Tuesday the pennant chase continues as Wade Boggs and the Boston Red Sox meet Cal Ripken and the Baltimore Orioles beginning at 7:30. Then the second place White Sox and reliever Bobby Thigpen meet the red hot Oakland Athletics. That pennant chase doubleheader beginning at 7:30. That's Tuesday. Here's Craig Worthington to lead it off for the Orioles. We go to the second inning, one to one, and the Wills curves him for a swinging strike. One to one. By the way, Joe, a Radio City Music Call just called and said if you'd like to have a private showing, invite me and maybe George <laughs> Bell. We could show in the zone on the big screen there at Radio City. Anything for you now. <laughs> that's a ball, one and one. I understand you're going to be in Baltimore Tuesday. To do, or that's a strike, rather. Oh, and two the count. Going to be in Baltimore on Tuesday for the Orioles Red Sox game for ESPN. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I've have not been to Baltimore lately. I'm looking forward to going there. I like the ballpark. Off the hands, Gruber up with it. Plenty of time. Worthington a slow runner, and there is one away. There's some folks in one of the private. That's in the hotel room. That was in one of the hotel rooms overlooking the ballpark, way up there, and way out there. Maybe that'd be the perfect thing, though. You have a party in one of those. Invite all your friends. And those who uh, don't like the ball game, go watch TV. Call room service. Here is Tettleton, and he looks at a called strike. Oh, and on the count, Mickey Tettleton. We just saw Worthington. Now we're looking at Tettleton, and these are two fellows who had very fine years for the Orioles a year ago when they stayed in it till the final weekend. Tettleton hit 26 home runs, but he has 12 right now and none in a long time. Gruber has it. Two gone in the second inning. You mentioned Telton has not hit a home run. He's having trouble getting around on the ball. He fouls this over toward the stands. Gruber goes over. Nice play. He just kind of waits for it. <laughs> Braces himself against the, the wall. No chance for the fans to reach over and interfere. Mike Devereaux now. Two down. Nobody on. Another uh, very fast outfielder, but he suffered a hamstring pull. Both he and Brady Anderson, two of the Orioles' fastest runners, have uh, sustained injuries this year, which have cut down their running game for much of the season. One to one tie. Into left field. Ducey over to his right a bit. Three up, three down against Frank Wills for the Orioles. We'll return to the Sky Dome. The score. One. Back at the Sky Dome, Sunday Night Baseball on ESPN, our last Sunday night game of 1990, our premier season. And we've seen uh, just about every ballpark around the country these last 23 weeks. We started in Canada back on Easter Sunday, the Mets at Montreal, and we finish in Canada tonight, which is not to say we're finished. The ball is outside to Rob Ducey, a left-handed hitter, a native Canadian. In fact, a native Torontonian, as they say here. Devereaux in the deep center. Plenty of room out there, however. And Ducey is retired. One away. One to one in the last of the second. There's the bar area out there in center field. Again, those uh, bar stools right out front go for $1,500 per stool. Jose Canseco, when Oakland was in last, almost hit one into that bar area, which is six stories above. The floor. I mean the, the ball field, at least six stories. Devereaux started back, now he has to come racing in, and he got it. Made a mistake on that one, a misjudgment on the ball hit by Myers, but he was able to recover. Two down. Myers took a big swing and Devereaux broke back, then he came on very quickly. That's what speed will do for you. It'll help you make up for the mistakes that you make in the outfield. He ends up making a nice play, but it should have been a little more routine. Now Manny Lee. Manny Lee was off to a very good start this year, but in the second half of the year he's been slumping. 
In fact, they had so much confidence in him, uh, confidence in him, that they traded Nelson Liriano to Minnesota to get John Candelaria some added insurance with a stretch run out of the bullpen. But then Lee's averages tailed off ever since. Maybe that's maybe Liriano was pushing him a little bit because Liriano was playing as well. So a lot of times that happens. A player gets the job by himself and he relaxes a little too much. Bill Ripken throws him out. And the Blue Jays go down in order. So we played two full from Canada. The Orioles won, the Blue Jays won. That's the way it was the final weekend of 1989 in this building the Orioles and the Blue Jays and although it was a heartbreaking day for the Orioles and their fans many of whom had made the trek up from Baltimore for that series they take that again as opposed to where they are now sixth place and just trying to be a spoiler here is David Segui a fellow that spent most of the year in the minor leagues he drives one deep in the right center field Junior Felix cannot get to it he's got a very strong arm but he has no play at second. Segui has a stand-up double. He's a switch hitter, first ball swinging, the son of a former major leaguer, Diego Segui, a pitcher. The well, first pitch is a fastball, and he jumps all over it. It's up a little bit. Hits the ball very hard in the right center field. Felix act like he had a shot at it, but he went across, and then all of a sudden he realizes he can't get it. It's over his head, and he plays it perfectly to keep it to a double. Now this guy was really struggling but the last week to 10 days he has come on he's been getting a lot of base hits. He's had four hits in the three games he's played in this series now. Bill Ripken. That's going to be fair and Gruber kept waiting on it and Ripken gets a hit. Now that was a weird one. Well I don't know what he was thinking because if he would have taken the ball the first time he charged it he could have thrown Ripken out at first base. He seemed to think it was going to go foul, but why do you want it to go foul? Take the out at first base. See him back off. There was no reason at that time he had a shot at Ripken. When he backs off again, he doesn't have a shot, and then he drops the ball anyway. Right there, if he would have continued to charge the ball, Ripken's out at first base. Bill Ripken's got average speed. Uh, Gruber was acting as though you had hit it, Joe, back in your well, prime. No, but I think he, he was worried about the runner coming from second base, but you can't do that. You just have to go ahead and take the out. Well, the Blue Jays have these problems uh, that crop up occasionally. That not a physical error, but a but a mental mistake. Now Finley, the bunted run is on. The runners are going, but the ball is fouled. A lot of people may ask you, why do you bunt and run? If you're going to sacrifice the guys over anyway, why are you sending them? Well, if you use a bunt and run, you do not have to direct the bunt any place. See, a tough bunt is to bunt the ball down the third baseline and make the third baseman field it. So what you eliminate here is that problem. So if the runners are going it's kind of like a squeeze you just butt the ball anywhere you can fairly and it makes it a lot easier for the bunner. You usually use that with guys who do not handle the bat very well. So Frank decided to put it on. Well they've got a shot at Segui and they get it. Segui is a very slow runner. And Finley had the same problem yesterday in the same inning. Well, that's why Frank tried to put the button run on to eliminate this. The job of, of Finley is to bunt the ball to the third baseman, make Gruber feel it. He doesn't do that. So now when Myers comes out, he has an easy play at third base. You can see Gruber's there and no chance for Segui. I don't care who's running, he's going to be out on that play. Ball was bunted right out in front of the plate. Now Brady Anderson. And again, little things like that have plagued the Orioles all year long. Brady Anderson. Hit into a force play his first time. Strike one, says Tim McClellan. But then he stole second, stole third, and scored on an error for the Orioles' only run. I think that was a good example of 
a manager knowing his players, knowing their limitations. He knows that he doesn't run very well. He also knows that Finley has trouble pushing the ball down the third baseline. So to eliminate both of those problems, you go with the bunt and run. And Finley just did not bunt it fairly. Well, the Orioles do for years as Anderson takes strike two. We're really a power ball club. Earl Weaver's uh, strong pitching and three run homers uh, idea, which worked so well for so long. And as they started the rebuilding last year, they said, let's play some little ball. Let's play with the speed game. Let's manufacture runs. Uh, let's improve the defense. And they did all of those things. But this year, the, the so called little ball has not been there for them. Unfortunately, the home runs have not been there either. One ball and two strikes to Brady Anderson. One out, two men on in the third. A 1 1 ball game. There's Bill Ripken, who got an infield hit. He's at second. And Steve Findlay, who's a very fast runner, but not a very good butter. <laughs> He's at first. Yesterday in the ball game here, he did almost exactly the same thing. I mean, he bunted right out in front of the plate. Myers threw out the lead runner at third. Well, it's not easy for a left hander to push the ball down the third baseline. That is a base hit. Now, can Bill Ripken score? He's not going to be allowed to try. Ducey throws in behind him to Fernandez, but Bill Ripken is back. His dad, Cal, holding him up. Durwood Merrill, the umpire, on top of the play. Well, Brady Anderson takes the pitch and he shoots it to left field. Even though it's on the inside part of the plate, he goes the other way. There's Ripken coming around, but no chance to score as his father stops him. Ducey threw behind him with Tony Fernandez covering, but no play. Actually, Ducey, that's not a smart play. He has to throw the ball to the cutoff man, let the cutoff man cut it off and try to throw behind the runner. In that spot, the cutoff man would have been Gruber, the third baseman. Here's Cal Ripken, and it's an accidental foul. Cal. But chagrined that that ball hit his bat, he wanted it to be ball one, strike one instead. This has not been a very good year for Cal with the bat. He's been unbelievably good with the glove, playing every game of the whole year. Cal has made three errors at shortstop, but with the bat, hitting below 250, hitting only 220 with men in scoring position, he does lead the team in RBIs though with 78. That is a nice play by Gruber. They get one. Coming in to score is Bill Ripken. And Finley takes third. Brady Anderson is forced out. It's a very tough play that Gruber makes going deep in the hole. And AstroTurf compounds it because the ball takes a high hop. And if it hits the ground again, it's going to go past him. He grabs it, but now he's off balance. So he has to backhand the ball to second base, and he makes a perfect throw. And I think that's why Manny Lee wasn't able to try to throw make a throw to first base. He had to stay there in case he had to adjust him his move across the bag to Gruber's throw. And you saw Finley now over at third. There's Cal Ripken at first. Johnny Oates is the coach over there for the Orioles. Longtime big league catcher. The batter Sam Horn. By the way we mentioned Cal Ripken with three errors playing every game of the season at shortstop. The all time major league record was uh, broken last year by Tony Fernandez. He made six. Ball one to Sam Horn. This Cal, 30 years of age now, Joe. He's getting a little thin. Uh, the hair's thinning a little bit on top. He's the elder statesman in this ball club now. Is this yes. crowd quiet or what? Well, as their team is losing. They know that they can move within a half game of the Boston Red Sox if they can win this ball game. But now that they're losing, they're a little quiet. A little quiet. Somebody just shouted at us to keep it down up here. <laughs> one ball, one strike to Sam Horn. And we should end the inning. Manny Lee will take the short one to Fernandez, and that retires the side. So the Orioles a scratch and claw and get a run, three hits, and they lead the Blue Jays two to one. Way I mentioned that although this is our final Sunday night telecast, we will ourselves be in action next Sunday. Nonetheless, in the afternoon we'll be in Pittsburgh as the Cardinals face the Pirates. Joe Morgan and me, John Miller, Joe's favorite play-by-play -play announcer, has told me many Correct. times in private. 
<laughs> Last of the third, Junior Felix. And as I told Jim Palmer just yesterday, yes, just yesterday, Joe Morgan, my favorite Hall of Famer. <laughs> I'm sure he liked that. Well, he said he understood. <laughs> One ball and no strikes to Junior Felix. And it's a ball, two and zero. Oh. This fellow is is rather short, but he is enormously strong, and he hits tremendous home runs. He's got a strong arm. If they say if he ever puts it all together, that's a fair ball, and he is retired. That he could do some amazing things. One away. It's a two to one ball game here. Let's go now to Dave Marish. John, here's why Toronto is within a game if they win tonight in Chicago. The Red Sox. Sammy Sosa for the White Sox dumps the little looper into right field and scores at Ron Karkovice. Put the Sox up 3-2-0, uh, and they won it 4-2. Chicago beating Boston. Thanks, Dave. And as you saw the fan there with the broom, they got it out and they swept the Red Sox four in a row. Here is Mookie Wilson. Ball one from Dave Johnson. Mookie, the leadoff hitter, flied out to left center his first time. You know, last week, the Blue Jays were playing the White Sox in here. And they swept the White Sox in four. That really got them going. Not the White Sox, the Blue Jays. And now the White Sox turn right around and uh, put it to Boston. Blue Jays, the White Sox are like their favorite cousins all of a sudden. Tuesday, Joe Morgan will be there in Baltimore. We'll see the Red Sox on ESPN and the Orioles. Some of you will see Milwaukee and Cleveland at 7.30. And then the White Sox at Oakland. Last chance for the White Sox. Trying to stay alive as long as they can. Worthington has no play. One of the things that Mookie Wilson did so well last year when he came to the Blue Jays was take advantage of hitting on AstroTurf every day. Not that he hit a lot of choppers like this, but he hit a lot of balls that went through the infield. That ball hits the front of the plate and bounces straight up in the air. By the time it comes down, Worthington doesn't even have a throw to make. Just eat it. And Mookie, once he gets to first, is not often likely to stay. He has stolen 23 bases, picks his spots well, Joe, only been caught four times. And I see that's what I look for. How many times has a guy been caught? It's great to steal bases, but if you take base runners off the bases for your team by getting caught, you have to suffer the consequences. There has been only one attempted stolen base against Dave Johnson this year, and that was just the other night. Alan Trammell, who told us afterward that he was running on first movement from Dave Johnson, he says this guy is murdered to try and get a jump against. Well, I don't think you can, you know, if you're a base stealer, you have to go on first movement anyway. You have to be able to realize whether he's coming to first base or going to the plate on his first move that he makes. And when a guy has such a quick delivery to the plate as Johnson does, you almost have to guess with him. You have to anticipate when he's going to the plate. That's exactly what Trammell said. And he said, well, but I guessed wrong. Mookie is just back in time. Well, I think the surprising thing is he has a quick delivery to the plate, but he also has a quick move to first base. Those normally do not go hand in hand. That's a pretty quick move. He's already set up a little bit open. You'll be able to see it very well from this shot. Mookie Wilson dies back and he gets there in time. And the pitch to Fernandez is a ball. But what you have to do as a base dealer, he throws over there a couple of times and then he freezes you and then he throws home. That's fine. But as a base dealer, you have to continue to try to get a jump. If you don't get it that this pitch, you work for the next pitch. You have to continue to fight. You can't just give up because the guy has a good move to first base. Back again. Dick Bosman, longtime major league pitcher, the now the minor league pitching instructor for the Orioles, taught Johnson this very peculiar looking set position. The idea of it is, according to, to Dave, is for him to be able to get the push off power on his back leg without making the big leg kick. We'll keep back again. And the other advantage is that his left leg is already open a little bit toward first base. So it makes it easier for him to pivot and make the throw to first base on the pickoff attempt. See his left foot is already watch when he opens up. He opens up a little more than he is right now. When he goes into his stretch. 
See, he steps over. Now that allows his hips to be open so he can go there quickly if he wants. Ball two. But like any move that's designed to really toward a base dealer, it has a weakness. The weakness is when he sets up so far to the left of the plate, it means he has to close farther to get back on line. So while he's closing is while you have to where you have to make up the difference between your lead at first base and his quickness to the plate. 2 and 0 to Fernandez. Ruber, the power, coming up next. Base hit. Mookie's going to try for third. Here comes Finley. Slow. Cut off. And the Blue Jays have runners at first and third with one out. And Gruber is coming up. Now they're making some noise. The thing that amazes me is that a normal, in Tony Fernandez's normal style of hitting, he doesn't pull the ball very much. But when he gets that runner at first with the hole on the right side, he pulls the ball, and that almost ensures a first and third every time because Mookie Wilson always takes a shot at it. Even though he tried it yesterday when I didn't think he should have, but today he makes it very easily, and it's a smart play by Ripken cutting the ball off that kept the ball from bouncing through Worthington and maybe giving Fernandez a chance to go down to second base. And it keeps the double play in order. Now Fernandez has also been known to steal a base. He's stolen 16, but he's been caught 12. His right knee is really bothering him. He thinks he might have to have some arthroscopic surgery once the season is over with. Here's Gruber, 28 homers now and counting. Ball one. He hit one here in the first inning. He hit one in his final at bat yesterday that won the ball game. And look at that. 17 RBIs in nine games, this being the ninth game. So he has been right there for the stretch run. Well, he's the George Bell of 1990 for the Toronto Blue Jays. Two to one Orioles, but the Blue Jays with a threat. One out. The infield double play depth. Ball two, and Dave Johnson. Has fallen behind 2 0 to Gruber after falling behind 2 0 to Fernandez. And on deck is Fred McGriff. I think the fact that he fell behind 2 0 Fernandez had a little bit to do with the fact that Mookie Wilson was at first base and he was trying to hold him close. There's Frank Robinson. And defensively, they've set up for the double play. Billy Ripken is playing him to pull. Everyone else is pretty much straight away. Two and over the count. That will get a run home. Devereaux going back. Tagging is Wilson, and it's going to be all tied up. Sacrifice fly for Gruber. One hundred six runs batted in for Kelly Gruber. What were you saying about quiet here? What's that? You were <laughs> speak up a little bit. Well, Kelly Gruber gets the job done. In this situation, you want to make sure you keep the ball off the ground. It's a fastball on the outside part of the plate, and he does a good job of getting it into the outfield in the air. The last thing you want to do is hit a ground ball. That, that's a good job of hitting right there by Kelly Gruber. Everyone says, yes, you want a base hit. That's true. But your first priority is to get the ball into the outfield in the air, if possible. Fred McGriff, he's hit 34 home runs this year. And that's a strike. Only three other Blue Jays have ever driven in 100 runs or more in a season. Willie Upshaw, George Bell has done it three different times, including last year, and Jesse Barfield is now with the Yankees. McGriff has never done it. McGriff. I think McGriff is still learning to be an RBI man. He is already a power hitter. But there is a big difference between being a power hitter who just hits the ball out of the ballpark and being an RBI man who gets the two out hit with a runner at second base. That takes a little experience. You have to understand the pitchers. You have to understand and know all of your weaknesses and strengths. Ball one. One ball, one strike. It's a 2-2 tie. We're in Canada. Sunday night baseball on ESPN. From the Sky Dome, the dome is closed. And it's very warm in here. Much warmer than outside, we can tell you. And we've got uh, a wild start to this one. Two to two. Each team is scoring single runs in the first and third. The Blue Jays still batting. Fernandez back to the bag at first. 
McGriff at the plate. He walked his first time. When you talk about McGriff, I don't think you ever become a good player until you know your strengths and your weaknesses. I think McGriff is still learning which pitch that he hits best for a single, which pitch that he hits best for a home run. I think you have to know the difference between the two. Bill Ripken out in the shallow center to Segui, and that ends the inning. One run and two hits for the Blue Jays, though. We're heading for the fourth. The game is all tied at two. Sky Dome. Everything feels fine in here. John Miller with Joe Morgan, a 2 2 tie. Craig Worthington will lead it off. That is not a typical Blue Jays fan. He's blue. <laughs> yeah, that's a camera, mister. <laughs> that's our camera, yeah. <laughs> Looks like he stepped in from the Middle Ages or something. Yeah. Craig Worthington grounded a third his first time. Frank Wills on the mound. And he takes ball one. Worthington drove in 70 runs last year, hitting mostly seventh, eighth, and ninth in the batting order. He missed uh, some time in the stretch run with a, an injury. They thought this guy was going to be a good RBI man for them, but this year he's just had no success. And they have a third baseman in the minor leagues by the name of Leo Gomez, who hit 26 homers with 97 RBIs at AAA this year. And he's due to report to the ball club tomorrow. And may get a look at him for a while. Worthington has hit the ball well lately, but still not for RBIs. Strike two. Jim Lefevre was talking the other day, Joe, about young ball players. And he's talking about some of the pitfalls that can befall a player in his second year. He says some of them just think, well, they're big leaguers and they quit working. They've got it made. And he struck him out. He says the others, they get off to a slow start and. They begin to press, think they have to get it done all together. The slump gets worse and worse. And others don't make the adjustments when pitchers have adjusted to them. Well, you definitely have to make adjustments. You get a look at this pitch is up and away from where it's a breaking ball. You see it's right on the outside corner. But it's up. It's really not a good pitcher's pitch. Worthington should have been able to get a piece of it, but he pulled off. Now Tettleton. Batting left-handed. He has not hit a home run since July the 19th. Two months. Hit 26 of them last year. And really hit 11 of his home runs this year in about a month's time. A ball and a strike to Tettleton. He's a switch hitter, batting left handed. He has the ability to become a free agent at the end of the year. And uh, most people feel that he'll have pretty good market value, a catcher, even with 12 home runs. Uh, catchers are a very highly prized commodity right now. One ball and two strikes. Tendleton, one thing he does do is he takes a walk. He's walked a hundred times. But Frank Robinson says he wished he'd walked a few less times and swung at a few of those pitches uh, along the way as an RBI man. Well, he has an unusual stance. Watch where he holds his hands. How he cocks his wrist and he's he's got him turned already. You have to get him back into a strong hitting position. That's a very weak position to start from. He maneuvers him into good hitting position, but it takes a little time to do that. And any wasted motion, in my opinion, is not good for a hitter. What about that straight up stance also? Yeah. I don't believe in the straight up stance. I don't believe in unorthodox stance. It's a base hit. Junior Felix with the artificial turf just laying back and waiting for the bounce. So that shows what I know about hitting. He just hits a line drive. That's as good a line drive as you can hit. All your credibility's out the window, exactly. Joe. It's a low fastball. He goes down and gets the ball pretty well for a guy that stands straight up. But see, now he gets his hands in a pretty good position there, but it takes a little while to get him there. And I would think that he'd have a real trouble with a good fastball on the inside part of the plate. Tattled at first with one out. It's a 2 2 tie. Here is Devereaux, another one of the young players who hasn't fared as well this year as he did last. Slider for a swinging strike on one. Slumping right now. Four hits in his last 32 at bats. They got him for the Dodgers just before the start of last season for Mike Morgan. Trade has worked out well for both clubs. Morgan got roughed up today, however, by the Reds, and the Dodgers were beaten a game really that they had to win. I think Mike Morgan really a struggle for the Dodgers lately. Although he's pitched some pretty good ball games, he just has not been consistent. 
I guess today was another example of that. Reds got six runs in the fifth inning to blow that one open. One and two on the changeup. When you talk about young players, I, I think the problem they have in their second year is when pitchers make adjustments to what they did the year before. For instance, if a guy hit a lot of home runs, hit the fastball inside well, well, of course they're going to start to pitch him away. And I think until a young player knows that he's a low ball hitter, or a high ball hitter, an inside hitter, an outside hitter, he can't become consistent. You have to know which pitches you handle best and lay off the other ones. And it takes a while before a young player realizes I'm a low ball hitter. I'm a low fastball hitter. I'm a low inside fastball hitter. See all that takes a little time and I think that's why you see a guy come up his rookie year he's great then they have they adjust to him and he doesn't make the adjustment right away to what they've done to him and it takes him a couple of years before he can bounce his back. Mookie Wilson into shallow right center calling off Junior Felix. Tantalin will have to go back to first. Two men gone in the fourth inning at 2 2 time. Is Tedlin back to the back at first? David Segui is coming up now. McGriff will play in the bag over there. David Segui, a switch hitter, he hit 336 at Rochester, but only two home runs. Segui had uh, some uh, surgery on one of his shoulders this winter. And he said he wasn't able to do the weightlifting and whatnot that he ordinarily does, and his strength was not good. He hit well for average, but not for power. They think this one, when he goes back into his normal weight routine, that he could be a guy who could hit 15 homers or maybe a little more in the big leagues. Just started getting it going here recently, as you see there in the last 11 games. Been driving the ball. At first, he wasn't even driving. <laughs> Wills knocked it down and Manny Lee is able to turn it into a put out at second base. Frightening moment for Frank Wills but he got it done. We go to the last of the fourth. George Bell lead it off. It's two to two. Sunday night baseball from Toronto at two two time. Don't forget CFA action on Saturday. The Colorado Buffaloes and the Texas Longhorns. Whoa Nelly. Seven thirty on Saturday. Well, David Segui hits a bullet back through the middle. You can see Wills gets a glove on it, which kept it from going in the center field for a base hit. And Manny Lee comes across, makes a nice play. Lee, of course, is breaking toward center field when the ball is hit, so it makes it an easy play for him once Wills slows it down. And now we go to the last of the fourth. George Bell, the hitter, he takes a ball from Dave Johnson. George Bell was out early taking extra batting practice and he was hitting the ball very very well to left field mostly he was not he was really getting the bat around and then you watch him in the ball game and he seems like he is not able to time the ball so I would still think that he's still suffering a little bit from those vision problems he's had lately that one is gone forget about it baby heading for the hotel I think not quite but what a shot Number 21 for Bell, his first in seven weeks plus. That's the way he was hitting the ball in batting practice. He was really turning on it just like that. But the first time up, we saw a fastball inside, and he seemed not to pick it up. And his bat was slow going into the hitting zone. On this play, watch how his bat just flies through the zone. Right there, nice swing, and he knows it's a home run from the moment he makes contact. This is a fastball on the inside part of the plate. And the first time up, he couldn't get around on that pitch, and this time he just turns on it. Good shot there, shows you it's right on the inside corner. As you know, and I've said before, I'm a big George Bell fan because. I know he normally does things very well under pressure when they need something done down the stretch it's usually George Bell that they call upon. Rob Ducey the hitter the one hopper to Bill Ripken who throws him out for the first out. Three to two Blue Jays here let's uh, get an update from Dave Marish at baseball tonight. John both the leaders lost in the NL East the Pirates did themselves in Gary Reed is here throwing away the round ball. Two runs scored on this play as Montreal won for the 13th time in 18 meetings. Meanwhile, at Shea Stadium, Darren Dalton's 12th home run of the season powdered uh, David Cohn. The Phillies won it eight to three. Half game separates these clubs. Montreal five and a half back. 
Thank you, Dave. Here's Greg Myers, the left-handed hitting catcher, and he fouls one off to the left. Three to two, the Blue Jays playing long ball. That's their favorite weapon of the year. They now have hit in 1990 158 home runs. Well, I think it's a great sign that George Bell was able to pull the ball. That gives him a lot of confidence as well as his teammates. That's not what they're saying down in New England. <laughs> it's a it's well, a threatening sign. Well, as I said last year, he almost single-handedly took them to the divisional title because he was very hot down the stretch. Bill Ripken, plenty of time, throws out the catcher Myers, out number two in the fourth. And if you add his bat to that of Kelly Grubers and Fred McGriff right now, I think you'll see they're going to take it. They're going to take it right to Boston. There's that uh, bar area on center field and you see that window there that's in straightaway center looking down into the restaurant and can Seiko hit when they hit the top window that angled window right at the top that hit the cement of the bar and a fan reached out and almost caught it that is quite a shot over the 400 foot side and almost into the bar not many guys in baseball history could say that they hit a home run into a bar <laughs> they hit him into Wrigley Field they hit him out into the streets and into patios things like that. Oh, and to the count and away. This new ballpark is a throwback to the old parks, which were built in the middle of neighborhoods, part of the neighborhood. In one way only, that they've built a neighborhood out there the hotel and the restaurants and the bars and the Hard Rock Cafe and that sort of thing. And you can go in and have lunch or dinner at any time of the day or night. I mean, any time during the business day, whether the Blue Jays are playing here or not. Bruce Connell, Jed Drake, and all of the producers and directors, uh, Mark Payton, they'll all be doing some uh, hard time at the Hard Rock later on, which is no surprise. Two strikes to count to Manny Lee. Lee grounded out the second his first time. Talking about George Bell getting hot. And certainly a good sign with the Blue Jays. Now with 21 home runs, Bell's just been the missing ingredient here. Fouled away again, but Bell, a former MVP, 1987. You remember in the stretch run? I mean, the last 10 days of the year when the Blue Jays could not win a ball game, and Ernie Witt was injured. The catcher, who was a, an important member of the club, Fernandez, who was a 300 hitter that year, and Bell began to press that. Final week and ended up going two for 26 in the stretch run. The Blue Jays lost each of their last seven games. Well, I think the games they lost in Detroit, Spark Anderson made up his mind that George Bell wasn't going to beat him and he wouldn't give him anything to hit in any kind of situation that could hurt the Detroit Tigers. So I think that also contributes to you pressing a little bit when they're not going to pitch to you. When you get a chance, a ball maybe a foot outside or whatever, you go ahead and swing at it. But those two guys right there. Are going to have to shoulder the weight for the rest of the way for the Blue Jays. That's Kelly Gruber on the right and George Bell. And like I say, Fred McGriff is mixed in between them. So they've got a pretty good combination going now. They just have to maintain that pace for the next 16 ball games. And Bell, a leader in that, he plays every day, he no plays matter what. Hard. He plays hard, he plays hurt. And he tries to do what it takes to win. Bell rarely takes a walk, but he feels like for the Blue Jays to win, he shouldn't take walks. Well, I think Kelly Gruber's a similar player. He leads by example. He really works hard and he plays hard. Manny Lee strikes out. Johnson really had to work hard to get him, but get him he did. Second strikeout for Johnson. But on the Bell home run, Blue Jays three, Baltimore two. There is ball one to Bill Ripken leading off for the Orioles in the fifth. The Orioles are trailing now, trailing for the first time in this one. Three to two, Toronto. Frank Wills. Face Ripken, then the top of the order, Finley and Anderson. Bill Ripken got an infield hit his first time. Bounces it foul. This is a guy playing in his brother's shadow. He seemed to have everything going against him. When he first came up in 87, people said, well, he's only up because his dad's the manager. His father was the manager at that time, and his brother's out there. It seemed like no matter what he did, he couldn't win, but he has made himself into a very fine all round player. He's always been a good glove man. And this year he's become a solid 280 type hitter. He was off to a real slow start, but then he got his act together working with hitting instructor Tom McCraw. 
And uh, Bill Ripken has hit 339 since uh, early August. Kept that average around 280, 290 all the while. Two and two the count. Now you can appreciate Joe, a guy who a lot of people said, well, he's not even a prospect. He shouldn't be here. Who has worked hard and made himself a legitimate big league ball player. Well, I think defensively he's always played pretty well, but to be a good hitter, as I mentioned, it takes a while to learn to hit in the major leagues. And he was under a lot of pressure. He had a home run here yesterday in the fifth inning, which he does not often do, but it was a clutch one. It tied the game. And then later in the same inning, his brother Cal hit a home run. It was only the fifth time in the history of Major League Baseball that brothers hit home runs in the same inning. The last time it was done was 1962. The brothers Aaron both homered in the same inning. Tommy and uh, <laughs> Hammer and Hank. He struck him out. George Bell hit a home run right up into that section, and uh, that fella caught it up there. Hey, you guys like ESPN? If you do, wave. They love it. By the way, I understand we're being carried tonight all across Canada on the sports network. So we say hello to everyone in Canada, viewing as well. Blue Jays leading three to two in the top of the fifth inning. Steve Finley is the hitter. He has walked and he has failed on a sacrifice bunt attempt. Finley 0 for 1. Check swing the appeal. Denied by Durwood Merrill. Durwood lives in a place called Hooks, Texas, but he was born in Oklahoma. And Joey says he's the only umpire ever born in Oklahoma to umpire in the major leagues. Which he mentioned, I guess, because that's a record. Pitch outside for a, on the outside corner for a strike. The uh, Orioles were not too pleased with umpire John Shulock, and it's interesting. They have kind of shifted the umpires around today. Well, the Shulock is where it's supposed to be at second base. I thought he was over at first, but Shulock's at second, and the Orioles are uh, feeling picked upon by Shulock. He was the man who made that call in the play on Mookie Wilson yesterday in the ninth inning, and the Orioles thought it was a bad call. The night before in a controversial ball and strike called him a Griff in the ninth and he also contributed to the Jays victory. Frank Robinson got into a rather nasty argument with the uh, shoe lock yesterday. Two and two the count to Finley. There's a long high drive deep into right field. Back is Felix back to the wall and this one is gone. We're all tied up. Finley with only his third home run of the year. And this is the way the Sky Dome plays when the roof is closed and we're seeing it firsthand. Three home runs have been hit and that's about the average for a nine inning game and the roof is closed here. Well in this ball game you have two pitchers without overpowering fastballs when they get the ball up in the strike zone. They're going to give up some home runs. And Wills gives a Steve Finley a fastball and it's up in the strike zone above the belt. And Finley hits it out of the ballpark. And we can see it's almost in the middle of the plate as well. Brady Anderson takes ball one. Brady has hit into a force play but scored a run, stealing a couple of bases. And he is singled one for two. Three to three, top of the fifth. One out. That's a strike. Steve Finley. That's Randy Milligan, by the way, on the left side of your picture to his right. And Randy leads the ball club in home runs, even though he has not played since early August. And uh, the very convivial fellow, very popular in the town and with his teammates. As it turns out, a guy they have not been able to replace in that batting order. Two and one to Brady Anderson. When Milligan was injured, the day he got injured, they were four and a half games out of first. And then the home run stopped, the run scoring stopped, and the Orioles bid for a pennant stop. Milligan crashed into Ron Hasse in the play at the plate at Oakland. And he scored the run, but Hasse got up and 
dusted himself off and stayed in the ball game and Milligan had to depart hurting his left shoulder and he has not returned since the Orioles record since he left 12 wins 26 losses Brady Anderson gets the walk well, we're getting close to the limit of Frank Wills he has not worked more than five innings in a game yet. Here's Cal Ripken coming up. He has struck out, hit into a force play. He hit into the force play in the third. It drove in a run. His 79th RBI of the year. Gruber, there's one. Manny Lee to first. Safe at first. It was a nice pivot by Manny Lee at second base, but the ball wasn't hit sharp enough for a double play. When you have two long throws, it has to be hit sharp. Here's Manny Lee coming across the back, which I think was a good play. It got him out of the way of the runner, but since the ball wasn't hit too hard, it was no chance. So I believe that a second baseman should come across the back and get his momentum going toward first base. Gets a lot more on the throw, and he can also avoid the runner. Manny Lee. Two down. The crowd again very, very quiet here. Sam Horn with a big swing. He fouls it off. Horn is flagged to left. Hit into a force play. Three to three. Top of the fifth. Blue Jays need a victory to pull it within one game of Boston but also after tonight there will be only 15 games left on the schedule. So they have a chance to get close and yet it's still not that close. They've got three games in Boston the weekend after next and Joe I mean if let's say they go in one game out still they're not in very good shape are they. Well I think they are if they can go in one up. That's foul. I think the toughest thing is going in being two down. I mean, then you have to win all three ball games. But if you go in one down, obviously, if you win two out of three, you're going to a playoff. So that's not like as tough a task as winning all three. So I think one, if they can go in one game down, they're not in too bad a shape. Of course, they want to go in with the lead because Boston's not playing very well right now. And they know if they can win three or four more games in a row, they may have a lead by the time they go to Boston. Boston losing today to Chicago losing four in a row at Chicago and those are the first four games of a ten game road trip for the Red Sox and they have not been a good road team not this year not in 1949 not I don't think in this century two and two to horn well also now because of the lockout three games are added at the end of the schedule after they play that weekend in Boston the Blue Jays will go to Baltimore for the final three the Red Sox will stay home and play the White Sox in the final three two down down the left field line Ducey on the run he's not going to be able to get to it it's off the wall Ripken going to third and he'll have to hold Horn is still on his way to second and he at long last makes it well I guess Reggie Jackson's lessons pay off because Horn lines this ball down the left field line. He had a fly ball that way the first, second time up. Ripken does not run as well as you'd like, but this is a low and away pitch, and he lines it down the left field line. And you would think that with two outs, maybe Ripken would have a chance to score, but he did not. Nice piece of hitting by Sam Horn. Now Galen Cisco goes out to the mound. We cannot see into the bullpens here. We don't know if there's any. Activity or not in the Toronto bullpen. The bullpens are out beyond the fences uh, in left field and right field. You can bet there's some action out there. And uh, there is some action out there. We now we can see it. It's on the big diamond vision, the Sony uh, vision out in center field. Right hander Jim Acker is warming up. There he is. Jim Acker, veteran right hander. 3 3 tie last up or the top of the fifth. The batter will be Craig Worthington who has grounded out and struck out. 
Well, Baltimore came into Toronto last year with three games to go, down by one. They needed to win two out of three to necessitate a playoff. And then when they lost the first one, uh, they were going to have to win three in a row if they were going to go. And that's a ball. No, that's a strike. That delayed call by McClellan. He only does that when we're on on Sunday night baseball, just to uh, just to try and nail us. Oh, and one. Runners at second and third. Two down. That's foul and out of play. On to the count to Worthington. We are at the Sky Dome in Toronto. It's a 3-3 tie in the top of the fifth inning. The Orioles and the Blue Jays. The Blue Jays trying to move to within one game of Boston. Blue Jays will stay home after this series while Boston continues out on the road. So Frank Wells had a little something left. The Orioles get a run, two hits. They leave two men in scoring position. And it's a 3-3 tie halfway through it. An aerial view of the Sky Dome in Toronto. Sunday night baseball the Orioles won the Blue Jays won out in right field is the Hard Rock Cafe. Hey, What would a ballpark be if it didn't have a Hard Rock Cafe inside. Looks like a big night there. John and Joe are number one I think they say maybe Chris Berman they mean I don't know. There it is the Hard Rock Cafe. I had lunch there the other day. The cheeseburger and fries and a lot of rock and roll. <laughs> Sort of like having lunch with Elvis. Here is Junior Felix. Base head, or is it? Yep. This artificial turf, Joe, can cause an outfielder to lose his aggressiveness. Well, I think that's one of the plights of artificial turf. There are artificial turf outfielders, guys that do not lose their aggressiveness, and then guys that play on regular turf, when they get on Astro turf, they, are, they play it a little safe. And, and you have to, truthfully. I don't think that's a bad situation you can't afford to overcharge a ball and let it bounce through you with a leadoff hitter ended up at third base with no one out you'd rather have him at first with one with no one out. So here we go again that is the fifth hit for the Blue Jays they have hit two home runs Gruber and Bell have each gone deep Finley of the Orioles has gone deep here's leadoff man Mookie Wilson he has gone shallow an infield single in the third and he eventually scored a run Johnson keeping him close when you look at Dave Johnson He's given up 28 home runs now in 157 innings. I mean, that's a lot of home runs. And that also accounts for his high earned run average going into the ball game of 4.19. But he doesn't strike out a lot of hitters. So if you give up a lot of hits as he does, more hits than innings pitch, you're always going to give up a few more runs. There goes Felix, but the ball is bunted by Mookie Wilson. Going to have to hurry. Got him. Felix stops at second. Well, Johnson was awfully casual about this play because Mookie Wilson runs well. Watch, he does not hurry himself. He doesn't seem like there is any urgency to make the play. He just kind of charges off the mound, takes his time, comes up, and then he just barely gets Mookie Wilson at first base. No hurry. And he just barely gets him. Nice play at first base by Segui digging that ball out. Tony Pena, the catcher for the Red Sox, saw Segui play in the Winter Leagues and said he thinks he's going to be an outstanding defensive player at first base. He moves well over there, has soft hands. Here is Tony Fernandez, and there's a man in scoring position. When I look at the Toronto Blue Jays, this is the way that I think they should play a little more often. Forget about the long ball all the time. Bun a few over. Whoa. That was a very strange move. In fact, it was a ball. I thought it was a ball. But I'm not sure what they're calling. Well, it looked like a balk to me. It looked like Shulock called a balk. And now it seems he's changed his mind. Ha <laughs> ha. 
and Frank Robinson is confused as well. He wants to go argue with Shulock, and yet the play went in favor of the Orioles. There's not much to argue about here. Well, watch him. He, he kind of moves like he's going to the plate right there, and then he turns around. You cannot make a movement to the plate and then turn and throw to second base. Could it? There's a drive in the right center field. Finley on the run. He's not going to be able to get to it. He'll have to chase it. Felix around third. He scores. Here comes Fernandez trying for third. Cal's throw. Safe. A triple for Fernandez. Or the non balk call doesn't matter here as Mookie Wilson scores on this triple hit by Tony Fernandez. Finley plays it back in. Looked like they had a shot at him at third. Ripken fires over. Fernandez goes in easily. Here's the throw by Ripken. And Fernandez in safely. And that was Bill Ripken, not Cal. Who made that throw? A triple for Fernandez. Blue Jays back ahead, four to three. Here's Gruber, but this time he pops it up foul. Sagi, will he have room? Yes, he does. Yes, he will. And to catch it, he does. And that is the second out. Holding at third, Fernandez. These, the triple by Fernandez, his 17th of the year. He leads the major leagues in that category. That was a very poor at bat for Kelly Gruber in this situation. Last time up, he battled, he waited, and he got the pitch that he could hit to the outfield. This time up, he swings at the first pitch, which is a high breaking ball, and pops it up. That's Daniel Boone in the bullpen for the Orioles. Yes, Daniel Boone, relative of the Daniel Boone. Distant. What team did he play for? <laughs> They're going to walk McGriff intentionally. Interestingly enough, with the right handed hitting Bell coming up next, but Bell homered his last time. Here's George getting ready for the challenge. Ball two. I think Frank Robinson normally plays the percentages, and percentages say that you have a better shot at getting George Bell out in this situation than you do Freddie McGriff, even though I have my doubts, but it doesn't matter what I think. Frank Robinson seems to think that Dave Johnson matches up better against George Bell than he does Fred McGriff. Well, Bell with a home run tonight, and he has homered twice against Johnson and only seven lifetime at bats against him. But I guarantee you, Frank Robinson knows that. He has those printouts, and he goes through them every day. This is what George Bell does when he hits a home run. He pulls the ball to the left of center field. All of his home runs have gone to the left, and he added one more tonight, which was down the line. Yeah. So he is a pull hitter when he hits the ball out of the ballpark. Here's George. Four to three. Big moment of the game here. A chance for the Blue Jays to open up a comfortable lead. Fernandez at third. McGriff at first. Curves him. Ball one. We saw George Bell hit a fastball out of the ballpark the last time up. So quite naturally you say, well, the pitcher's going to throw him a breaking ball and try to get him out this time. But I tell you what, George Bell can handle the breaking ball. Just off the corner, ball two. Fernandez at third base. McGriff at first with Sagi. Both ready to go on anything with two down. In the fifth. Six hits for the Blue Jays, including two homers and a triple. And a single base hit left field, five to three, Toronto. Bell is back. I don't care what George Bell is hitting. I don't care whether he struggled. I don't care anything. If you've got a runner at second base, I like George Bell because he knows how to hit with runners in scoring position. He gets himself a pitch that he can handle. This is a little breaking ball in the inside corner, and he pulls it in the hole for a base hit. But George Bell is an RBI man. And I think he's still one of the most underrated players in the American League. 
even though the managers and the other players will say that he's not underrated. Now Robinson out there with Tim McClelland. I think what Robinson was saying is that maybe I hadn't made up my mind yet. But now he has I guess. So Daniel Boone is going to get the call. An interesting story. 36 years of age. He had not pitched in the majors since 1982 for Houston. He pitched against the Giants that day against uh, among others a fellow by the name of Joe Morgan who was right. managed by Frank Robinson. Here he comes. Seventh generation relative of the Daniel Boone will be back. 36 year old Daniel Boone back to the big leagues after being away for eight years and uh, he was away from pro ball for six years and here he is 11 and five eight saves at the minor league level he pitched in the senior league this past offseason I mean it was the on season for the senior league and the Orioles like what they saw he had picked up a, a knuckleball so they signed into a minor league contract he'll come on to face the pinch hitter Kenny Williams a right handed batter batting for Rob Ducey runners at first and second two runs in the Blue Jays are leading five to three strike one well, when he pitched for the Padres he did not have the knuckleball he was a fastball breaking ball pitcher a lot of breaking balls and the time he reminded me today of the time he faced me with the bases loaded and he said he walked me strike two Williams helping him out on that one but as most pitchers always told me they were strikes but the umpire gave them to me so he said they were on the outside corner <laughs> The two base runners at second base McGriff Bell at first two down in the dirt knocked down by Tattleton one ball two strikes. I'm not so sure you'll see a knuckleball in this situation because he may not want to wild pitch and move the runners up but it's a tough job for Tattleton to have to all of a sudden start catching a knuckleball after he's been catching a regular pitcher but he did not even glow to a larger glove either which is surprising. Check swing and right back to Daniel Boone, who, by the way, is a seventh generation nephew of the pioneer, great character in American history, Daniel Boone. And he's back in the big leagues officially now. We'll be back in a moment. That big board out in center field is 115 feet wide and 35 feet high. Here's Kenny Williams, the new left fielder. That, uh, you've seen those big. Uh, almost like gigantic television sets in many stadiums are now and this one is the size of three of those put side by side. I mean <laughs> it's designed so that even if you're sitting clear across the stadium from it as we are it would have the same clarity and look about the same as a television sitting in your living room. A big television. Mickey Tendlin fouls one off one ball one strike Tendlin leading off against Frank Wills who's still in there. Now with a five to three lead. Tendleton has fouled a third and single to left. Devereaux and Segui will follow. Yes. The appeal to Durwood over at third denied. Two and one. Frank Wills, 32 years of age, or at least he will be next month. Center field, but Mookie takes it. One away in the six, five to three Toronto. Let's take it now to Dave Marish at baseball tonight. John Lupinella's Reds have a little more breathing space tonight, and one reason this dinger from Chris Sabo, 24th of the year. Mets, uh, the Reds rather, won at nine to five over the Dodgers, lead LA by five and a half, and San Francisco by seven and a half. Reds are closing in on the title now, even though they have. They haven't played that well for a long period of time. Well, they've been under 500 for a long period of time. So I, you know, they say all you have to do is play 500 to win, and that's basically true for Cincinnati. After that great start, remember they went 33 and 12. That's Devereaux fouls one, and then that qualifies as a great start. Since then, as you see them now, 82 and 63, they have gone 49 and 51. 
below 500 for a hundred games. But if you build up a big lead, it doesn't matter. And a five and a half game lead at this stage is a lot of, you know, a lot of game. That's a big lead. The red zone because eight. it's actually six in the loss column. That's right. Dodgers 69 losses, Cincinnati 63. The Reds only have 17 games left. The Dodgers only 16 left. The Reds magic number now is 12. Any combination of Reds wins and or Dodgers losses equaling 12. And the Reds will have clinched it. Devereaux has flied out twice. He has a count of one ball and two strikes. Blue Jays ahead five to three. We're in the sixth inning, and again the crowd very quiet. It's like a theater crowd. Two and two. I feel like I'm doing the Canadian Open here, Joe. <laughs> 328 feet down the line, a slightly up uphill line. With a nine iron. Shadow left. Out number two. Now we are taking you into one of the luxury suite condominium style boxes where people are watching the ball games, getting liquid refreshments or whatever they want. You have to sign, I understand, a 10 year lease to get one of these. <laughs> they could cost you uh, as much as what, 250000 a year? Is that right? So you got to commit to two and a half million. I was going to see if you wanted to get one Joe but no. they told me there weren't any available. Good. <laughs> one ball and no strike. Maybe you if you get one of those you can just move into it. <laughs> Sell the house. That's still too expensive. Sagi pops it up. Gruber has room. And the Orioles are going just like that. So the Jays get Wills the lead. And he responds in kind, setting the Orioles down one, two, three. We go to the last of the sixth. Blue Jays five, Orioles three. Here we go now to the last of the sixth inning from the Sky Dome in Toronto. This is John Miller. Along with Hall of Famer Joe Morgan. And we're glad to have you with us tonight. It's September. We're in the pennant race. And uh, this is the view in our booth. And uh, don't think this uh, comes cheaply either. <laughs> Thanks, Joe, for picking out the tab. Well, that's a nice booth. I just think we're a little far from the field. But like you say, it's such a big place. It's a magnificent place. I'm, I'm really impressed. I really am. So I brought my binoculars. Daniel Boone to the pinch hitter, Pat Borders. And it is ball one. By the way, we're talking about Daniel Boone and how the Orioles uh, acquired him. They picked him up uh, with a minor league contract after seeing him in the senior league this uh, winter. And Bertie Tebbets, Orioles special assignment scout, saw him. Bertie, longtime major league catcher, played with and against the best for many, many years, and a major league manager, a great judge of talent working for the Orioles. Now. Bertie, we understand, is home watching the ball game tonight. And we'll see who. Told Roland Heeman, say, hey, this guy looks like he can do some pitching. Why don't we give him a look in the minor leagues? And Boone had a very fine year at Rochester. Two and one the count. Wow. Two and two got Borders chasing a bad one. Birdie, I'm not sure about this. We need confirmation. Birdie may have played with the Daniel Boone. <laughs> or managed him, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Strike three. Borders uh, caught looking. Tuesday night, Joe Morgan and Sean McDonough bring you the Red Sox and the Orioles. First game of our doubleheader. Some of you will see Milwaukee versus Cleveland. Then the second half of the doubleheader, Chris Berman and Tommy Hutton will be in Oakland to get a look at the high flying athletics facing the White Sox, who just had a, an amazing year. Manny Lee with a swinging strike. And yet they are 10 games back of Oakland with a record of 84 and 62. The White Sox have a better record than Pittsburgh, than Cincinnati, than the Mets, than Boston, than everybody except Oakland. <laughs> and yesterday it was announced that Larry Hines, the general manager, will not be back. Thank you very much, but see you later. 
One and two the count to Manny Lee. Jam packed the Sky Dome. They'll set the all time Major League attendance record here this year. The Sunday night baseball. And we've got the Blue Jays leading the Orioles five to three last of the six. Manny Lee the eighth place hitter a switch hitter now batting right handed. That was a slow one. That was a knuckleball. He had Manny Lee out in front a little bit. So I think people have the notion Joe that even if you haven't played the big leagues you never pitched if you mastered a knuckleball you could go back out there and pitch. He struck him out and that was no knuckleball. That was a curveball there. A big curveball as well broke straight down. I think a knuckleball is tough to hit because you can't gauge which way it's going to go and therefore it confuses the hitter. This is a curveball not a knuckleball overhand curveball. That's what I remember Danny Boone for when I faced him to a good overhand curveball. Here is Junior Felix. Felix got the fifth inning rally started with a base hit. He is one for two five to three the Blue Jays ahead he scored the go ahead run in the game when tripled home by Fernandez. right back to Boone. Boone has faced four hitters struck out two of them and got two of them to hit the ball very softly right back to him. Life was never so easy in the pioneering days of his great 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 uncle. Here we go to the seventh inning now. Bill Ripken leads it off against the new Toronto pitcher Jim Acker. Acker a right hander. Thirty two years of age at least he will be in about a week. And he's from a place called Freer. Texas. F R E E R still lives there. And the new catcher Pat Borders stays in the ball game after pinch hitting for Myers. Bill Ripken has an infield single and a run scored and he has struck out one for two. The Orioles need to. Some base runners here down five to three in the seventh. They play the Red Sox beginning tomorrow night in Baltimore for a three game series. But tonight a lot of Red Sox fans are rooting for the Orioles. Well looking at the ball game to this point Cito Gaston has gotten what he wanted from Frank Wills and that's to take him into the seventh inning with a lead. Now it's up to him to manage these last three innings using That is grabbed by Lee. Nice play. That was a nice play by Manny Lee. Goes up the middle. Now he gets rid of it very quickly. As a second baseman, you have two choices. You can get rid of the ball very quickly with not a lot on it, as he does there, or you can try to plant yourself, catch it, plant yourself, and then get something on it. I had to do it this way. <laughs> I didn't have a strong arm and that's a very good play by Manny Lee. So there's one away and now Steve Finley is up. Five to three Toronto ahead. Finley homered his last time he's also walked but that's a strike on the outside. There was that bunt that he did not get down. I mean he got it down but it didn't work. The sacrifice situation back in the third. Finley hitting 270. What Cito Gaston is doing now is using whatever he has left to get to his ace Tom Hinky. He will let Acker go as long as he doesn't get in trouble or he'll bring someone else in and try to get to the ninth inning with a five to three lead or more and then he'll bring Hinky in. But I think if he has to he'll bring him in sooner. That's up the middle base hit. Well, you mentioned it. He may go to him sooner. He's getting him ready right now. And that is Tom Hankey, the big guy on your right. The other big guy on the left is Dwayne Ward, both hard throwers. Well, I think he would probably use Ward if he could in a situation that might cause trouble. But I think he would save Hinky for the ninth if he possibly can. But if he can't, then he'll have to go to Hinky earlier. Here's this, Brady Anderson now. This is a very important ball game for the Blue Jays. Thank you. And of course the ace out of the bullpen has not been used very often. He has not even pitched in eight days. So he's well rested. Cito said he's got to get him an inning tonight no matter what happens. 
and said he's available to go too if if necessary. That's a strike to Brady Anderson. Most of the time you don't want to use your stopper more than one and a third or something like that. And I'm sure that's what Cito's thinking. He would rather not use him the two innings, but if he has to, he probably will. As I said, you have to play every game like it's the last game of the season for the rest of the way. And that means you have to use everything that's available to you. Use all your firepower. And Hinky is is their firepower out of the bit out of the bullpen. Two and one. Yankees will be here tomorrow for three games and then Cleveland comes in next weekend for three. And then the Blue Jays will have no more games at the Sky Dome. They'll have to play outdoors the rest of the year Milwaukee Boston and Baltimore their final road trip. There goes Finley and Brady Anderson fouls one into the batter's box two and two the count. There's the remaining schedule for the Blue Jays. Yanks beginning tomorrow night Cleveland next weekend and then two Milwaukee then at Boston weekend after next and finally those three games right at the tail end of the schedule at Baltimore. I think Milwaukee spells a lot of trouble for him because the Brewers are starting to put in some numbers on the board. Monitor Yount well, Parker, Yon's, Sheffield Yount has really started to swing the bat well after being silent most of the season. Finley back. Finley leads the Orioles in stolen bases with 20. By the way, talking about the schedule the rest of the way, the Blue Jays have the worst home record of any contender right now. All three. The Mets have the best. Oakland is next. The Red Sox have the third best. The Blue Jays are behind them all, behind even the Dodgers, the Reds, the Pirates. They're just barely over 500 here. Five to three, Toronto ahead. There goes Finley. The ball is popped up. Manny Lee will give way to Fernandez. Finley back to first. And Cal Ripken comes up, representing the possible tying run. Cito Gaston was you're talking about using Hanky and Cito did not use Hanky yesterday in the ninth inning to protect a one run deficit and he didn't bring him in Friday in the night to protect a one run deficit and in each one of those innings the Blue Jays gave a, up a run to fall two runs down and he seemed like he was playing for to protect Hanky for tomorrow in a game that they might be leading but. Well, I think that's a very good point and that's the way a lot of managers play with their stopper. They do not bring him in when they're one run down or sometimes even in a tie ball game. That's if you have the luxury of doing that. But when you're chasing someone as the Blue Jays are you don't have the luxury of playing the game the way you want to. You have to try to win every game. And if you need to use Hinky to keep you close to win a ball game then you have to do it. You don't pitch him for four or five innings of course but if you have to go with him for one inning. I think that's what you have to do. But I think, you know, talking to Cito, he felt, you know, a little differently about the situation. And obviously, that's his prerogative. I think that uh, you will see him use Hinky more because I think he felt like he may have made a mistake. Not necessarily that he did, but he may have. You know, I don't think there's any way you can tell whether you made a mistake or not, so especially since they won both of the ball games. But I think if. Uh, You'll see Hinky a little more down the stretch than you have lately. Cal just gets a piece of it. Two strikes to Cal Ripken. We're in the seventh inning. Cal has struck out, hit into a force play, and hit into a force play again. He did get an RBI in one of those force plays. Jim Acker, the second Toronto pitcher. The reason I think that this streak has affected Cal Ripken is something that Frank Robinson told me about eight years ago. He said, Cal Ripken was going to be a guy to hit 40 home runs a year, drive in 100 runs, et cetera, et cetera. And he has not done that. And I respect Frank's opinion because he knows what a hitter is and he knows what a good hitter is. And he felt like Cal Ripken was going to be that type of guy. And maybe it hasn't affected him. Maybe Frank overrated him. I don't know. But he has not been the same guy, you know, the last six years. Although he's hit 20 home runs a year. Base hit. Finley will stop at second. And the batter will be a big Sam Horn. Horn 
two nights ago came up as a pinch hitter in the sixth inning with the bases loaded against reliever Dwayne Ward and hit a grand slam on an 0-2 pitch. Tonight he's flied the left grounded to second and he has doubled the left and here comes Cito Gaston and maybe here comes Tom Hinky but they had Dwayne Ward up in the bullpen as well so we'll see which one he calls upon. Well there's the two of them there are the two of them. Neither one know who's been called in as yet. Shulock, the second base umpire, is trying to alert somebody out there to tell the right. They need to give the umpires a, a cellular phone or something to have out there to call the bullpen. They can't see from out there. Well, he's asking for the right hander, but there are two right handers <laughs> out there, John. Well, he wants the right right hander, but who's that? It's Dwayne Ward. Yeah, I, I think this is a better move than bringing Hinky in in the seventh inning. Interesting. Two nights ago, Ward came in, and Horn hit the grand slam against him. Cito's going right back to him. Well, since he doesn't have, as I mentioned earlier in the ball game, when they brought guys out of the bullpen to make them starters, it weakened their bullpen. And you have to remember, David Wells was a left-hander. That was a stopper also in the bullpen. Now he's in the starting rotation. So they do not have a left hander that they have this kind of confidence in uh, that to bring in in this situation a pitch to Sam Horn. Well, they have Candelaria and he's hurt right now. He had a shot in his elbow yesterday. Well, Dwayne Ward replaces Jim Acker. And uh, Jim Acker, if he can, will be watching that ball game Saturday night from Austin, Texas. Colorado and uh, the Longhorns Jim Acker out of the University of Texas. He'd go in and watch it now if it was on but this is what's on Dwayne Ward on a relief of Jim Acker. This uh, big fella is a real hard thrower. But he got lit up here two nights ago. He came on a relief of Jimmy Key who had to leave because of an injury in the sixth inning and Ward gave up six runs including a grand slam hit by this man Sam Horn. Two men on two men out in the seventh inning. Horn has hit 12 home runs this year in 208 at bats. So he's averaged about one homer every 17 at bats or so. Well, you no one will forget his opening day. He had a couple of home runs on opening day. One against Brett Saberhagen, a three run shot, and then another three run shot in the eighth inning that tied the game. A ball and a strike. Frank Robinson Hall of Famer 586 home runs in his career. Only Mays Ruth and Aaron in the whole history of the game hit more homers than that man. Steve Finley at second Cal Ripken at first. Hanky still up in the bullpen. Dwayne Ward has tried to keep the fastball in tight on Sam Horn. We'll see if he's successful doing that. That's a ball, two and one. Sam doesn't like the ball in there. Most people do not, <laughs> especially if it has good velocity. If it's over 90 miles an hour, you don't like the fastball inside. This one's over the plate, but high. Both runners ready to move here with two down. Two and one to Horn. Three and one. Worthington, a right handed hitter, is on deck. Well, you may see Hinky sooner than we think, but it's a tough situation for Ward to come in and have to pitch to Horn when he gave up the home run before. You have to be careful, and I think that's what he's doing. He's tried to go in and then out, in and out. Now he's down in the count. He's going to have to go right after him. Three and one the count. And two. And he went right after him and threw it right by him. The question is, can he do it one more time? It's a good fastball on the outer half of the plate. And Horn swings through it. Is that a pitch that Horn should be swinging at on three and one? Well, I think he, does, he has to because he's a free swinger. He can't afford to go three and two and then only get one swing at it. There go the runners. And that is a high.
fly, lazy fly to Ken Williams territory. Left field and the inning is over. Ward gets him this time. And the Blue Jays are still leading as we go to the last of the seven. Top of the order coming up. The roll aids relief break. Bobby Thickpen added to his total today. He got his 51st save for the White Sox in their victory over the Red Sox. Dennis Eckersley just having a great year, though. And over the National League, Franco of the Mets is number one, and Myers of the Reds is number two. And here we go into number seven. Last half thereof, five to three, the Blue Jays leading the Orioles. And Mookie Wilson, a switch hitter batting right handed now. Wow. That pitch floated up there. One ball, one strike. Mookie has flied out. He's had an infield single and scored a run, and he's had a sacrifice bunt. Doing well. You mentioned about the Blue Jays at the time that he had the sacrifice, needing to do a little more of that when necessary. That was the 16th sacrifice bunt by the whole Blue Jays team for the whole year. They are well on their way to setting the all-time record for fewest sacrifice bunts in the whole history of Major League Baseball. Well, they usually rely on the power because this ballpark lets them play that way. They hit a lot of home runs on the road, etc. But I think the bunt is very important when you're going down the stretch and in tight ball games. That's out of play. People are not many people uh, sidling up to the bar out there. The first base lounge. They're over uh, taking a look at the ball game out there. Many uh, venues from which to watch the ball game. There are nine major restaurants, uh, cafes, and lounges in the ballpark. Steve Finley's got it, and Mookie Wilson is retired, one away. Well, this ballpark, uh, they do have a great baseball tradition here in Toronto. Twenty men who played in the major leagues were born in Toronto, including the old relief pitcher John Hiller of the Tigers and Ron Taylor. Well, you probably batted against Ron Taylor with the Cardinals and the Mets and among other ball clubs. He is now Dr. Ron Taylor and he is the Blue Jays team physician. Here's Fernandez. He has a single and a triple. Fernandez has a bad right knee. We mentioned that earlier and he says it really affects him when he bats right handed. Makes it very difficult for him to uh, to get any kind of drive on the ball batting right handed. Certainly does it on that event. Two men down. Sparky Anderson once managed the old Toronto Maple Leafs in the International League. Dick Williams managed here. Chuck Dressen, Mel McGahey, Burley Grimes. A long and a very rich baseball tradition here. Philadelphia beat the Mets today. Although Len Dykstra went hitless and he has fallen behind Willie McGee in the batting championship race. Montreal. Got a one hitter against Pittsburgh. Pirates remain just a half game up on the Mets. Gruber has a base hit. His second hit. Earlier a home run and a sacrifice fly. He's got a lot to smile about these days. Well, he's been playing very well. In fact, the Blue Jays have a lot to smile about because they have all their guns firing again at the same time. And that's Kelly Gruber, McGriff, and of course George Bell. Here is McGriff. He has walked twice and grounded out the second. That is a base hit. Gruber will stop at second as Finley fires into Cal Ripken, the cutoff man. Back to back singles with two down, and the table is set for George Bell. Bell has a home run and a run scoring single. Two RBIs. There are nine players who played minor league ball here with the old Maple Leafs who are in the baseball's Hall of Fame, including Ralph Kiner, Carl Hubble, Charlie Geringer, Heine Manouche, Hugh Duffy. I don't know if Bell will ever make it to the Hall of Fame, but he certainly had some great years in the big leagues here in Toronto. Two on, two out. Daniel Boone misses high, ball one. I think you'll see a lot of knuckleballs from Daniel Boone in this situation because wild pitch will not necessarily hurt them a lot. His job now is to make sure he gets George Bell out. Giorno 
two knuckleballs he's thrown and both of them have been outside. As far as we know there is no activity in the Orioles bullpen. And there is no activity in the Blue Jays bullpen. At the same time. Ooh. Two and one. It's good fastball there. You see a couple of knuckleballs and then the guy turns a fastball loose on you. It looks a lot faster than it really is and he got it in a good spot up and away. As Boone fires a fastball up and away and Bell cannot catch up with it. That's Gruber out there at second base. McGriff at first. Two down. That is foul. Two and two. George Bell got off to a great start in April, had a real hot month of June, but since then, not many homers. But I guarantee you, he will add some RBIs down the stretch. He may not hit a lot of home runs, but I know he's an RBI man. He will pick them up. Two and two, two down, two on. Found that one off. Daniel Boone weighs 142 pounds. When he pitched eight years ago in the big leagues, he weighed 137. And the Orioles of PR people, Rick Vaughn and company, have done some researching. The last time there was a pitcher in the big leagues who weighed that little, you have to go back to the 1920. How's that for trivia? <laughs> That's foul. Two and two. Well, when I saw him in the clubhouse today, if he weighed 142, it was after he had run a few laps and had the sweaty clothes on. He is not a big guy. He's a very small guy. And for me to be able to say that, you know, he's pretty small. Two on, two out. That is foul. Well, that was Battling hard here against Daniel Boone. Two and two the count. That was a pretty good knuckleball from Boone because it was diving down and away. You can see all Bell can do is foul it off. That's a sign of a good hitter right there. To be able to spoil a hitter's good pitches and hope that he makes a mistake with the next one. You can see what George Bell has done in the last four years. 28 home runs and 104. RBI, that's an average. Misses with the curve, full count, three and two. Now Gruber from second base. And McGriff from first base will get a running start here. Well, Daniel Boone will not give in to George Bell in this situation because Kenny Williams is up next and he struck Williams out very easily in his only plate appearance. The runners go. And Bell able to get a bat, get the bat of the ball again. Actually, he lost. Actually, he didn't strike Williams out. He got the weak ground ball back to the mound, but Williams looked bad on the first two swings. So I think George Bell knows it, and I think Daniel Boone knows that he's going to throw him another knuckleball in this situation. Or maybe a curve, but he will not throw him a fastball near the middle of the plate. Fairground. Bill Ripken going out. Finley coming in. Finley calls him off and makes the catch. Boone has a hard battle from George Bell, but he uh, is able to hold the fort, so to speak. We go to the eighth. Five three Toronto. We're back at the Sky Dome into the top of the eighth inning now. John Miller with Joe Morgan. Sunday night baseball and Tom Hanke has come on. First action in eight days to try and wrap this one up. And uh, Joe, ordinarily, as you see, hanky has got some uh, great numbers for a closer. Ordinarily, uh, Cito likes to use him for just the one inning or so. You were talking about a little while ago. That's when he seems to be most effective. Well, they're bringing him in with two innings because he hasn't pitched for a while, but maybe once just to make sure that Hinky gets some inning in, innings in this week, and we'll see what happens. I just believe that most of the time they save their stopper till the last inning. And let him come in fresh in the ninth inning and retire the side. But 
This is a very important game again. I think that's why he's bringing Hinky in so early. Tom Hinky facing Craig Worthington, who has grounded a third and twice has struck out. Hinky, the fourth pitcher of the game, utilized by Cito Gaston. Five to three, Toronto leading. Strike in the outside. Hinky throws hard and he throws a uh, split fingered pitch. That's what you see mostly from Hinky, though, a good fastball. Strike two. Well, Worthington uh, standing and watching with the rest of us right now. You hate to be behind a hard thrower, 0 and 2. Sidearms it, but misses. Well, the reason you hate to be behind a hard thrower and two is simply because you don't have a lot of time to decide whether a pitch is in the strike zone or not, and you end up swinging at a lot of fastballs out of the strike zone. Two and two. I think he rarely walks anybody. Only 14 walks, 66 strikeouts. Blue Jays success to count out three and two. It really began in 1985. That's when they really became a serious contender. 83 and 84 they were there as well but they didn't have the bullpen. They got Hanky, and he has been the one thing that they never had before that. They've been very steady. Except last year early he wasn't getting it done. Then he uh, was not being used by Jimmy Williams. Cito Gaston became manager and when he thought the time was right. Hanky got the job back and he's there all year for them again. 3 2 a pitch is hit to center. Just a high, lazy fly. Mookie Wilson's got it. Worthington is 0 for 4. That was a high fastball up and out of the strike zone. But as I mentioned, Hinky throws so hard you don't have a lot of time to decide. See, that's up around the shoulders. It's a high fastball. This is Hinky's motion. That's what it would look like if you were flying over, say, uh, on your way to Montreal or maybe overseas. <laughs> yes. Here's Tedlin. Takes a strike. Yeah, if the roof were open. Tedlin, one for three, batting left handed. This big ballpark down near the lakefront on the shores of Lake Ontario. Yes. A ball and a strike and they've always had ballparks pretty well always on the lakefront here the old Maple Leafs and the International League played at Maple Leafs Park down in uh, just a few blocks from here. And before that they played uh, on what was called Hanlon's Point at the edge of Toronto Island just a little bit beyond uh, Maple Leaf Park and Babe Ruth hit his first ever professional home run there back in 1914. He hit it right out into the bay. And that baseball is still supposedly at the bottom of Toronto Bay. Strike two. You think of Toronto, Canada, you think of hockey and that sort of thing. Curling. Ice. The Hudson Bay. But they've got a great baseball tradition, and particularly here in Toronto, Montreal as well. Two and two the count. Monday night when the Yankees are here tomorrow night the Blue Jays will break the Dodgers all time attendance record three point six million is the record tonight's crowd puts them up to three million five hundred eighty six thousand break the Dodgers all time record tomorrow three and two so Hickey throws a fastball and his his split finger as he call it really looks more like a Fork ball because it kind of tumbles over. It doesn't go straight down like a lot of split fingers do. His seems to just tumble a little bit. 3 2 pitch. That'll go back out of play. Same formula he was using with Worthington on 3 and 2. The high fastball. Well, it's tougher for a right hander to get a strike from Hinky and to wait for a strike because being right handed, you have a little less time to see the ball. Out of his hand. Tettleton being from the left side gets a little better look. That one will be playable for Kenny Gruber. Two gone. 
Don't forget right after the ball game, Sports Center coming up. Plenty to report today on Sports Center, all the NFL and Major League Baseball highlights, and an exclusive conversation with Al Davis. Bob Lee and Dan Patrick join them for Sports Center after the ball game. Top of the eighth, two down, five to three, Toronto ahead. Mike Devereaux, the hitter, ball one. Devereaux has flied out twice and popped a short. Two and oh. Pennant race is coming into focus. The National League West, the Reds uh, may have dashed the final hopes of the Dodgers today, beating them nine to five. But in the National League East, the Mets just a half game back of the Pirates. Montreal really did a number on the Pirates this year. 13 out of 18 they won from the, the Pirates. And here in the American League East, while Oakland is way ahead of the White Sox in the West, the Blue Jays trying to make it just a one game differential between themselves and Boston. Three and one now to Deborah. And he walks him. Two out walk. Devereaux's aboard. And the rookie David Segui will get a chance here. He is one for three. This copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form in any language without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. He hit a double in the third. He hit into a force play in the fourth, and he fouled the third in the sixth. And that's a ball again. When they go to Hanky, when Larusa goes to Eckersley, when Chorborg goes to Thigpen, they've played their final card in effect out of that bullpen. Well, I think in this case they still have Ward left down there, but normally this is your last guy. This is the last guy you bring in. And with the injury to Candelaria, who received an injection in his elbow, he won't be available for a couple more days. One ball, one strike to Sagi. Two down, runner at first. There he goes. That's a drive in the right field. Felix is going back, still going back, and it's all tied up. David Segui has foiled the best laid plans of Cito Gaston and the Blue Jays. That is his first Major League homer. He had hit only two in Triple-A ball all year. How do you like that? Well, the problem is that Hickey was struggling with his control from the first hitter. And you can't pitch from behind where you give a guy a chance to just sit on your fastball. And maybe Hickey took a little off to throw a strike. But you can't let these guys sit on your fastball. And he was behind his count with all the hitters, so he had to throw a fastball for a strike. And Sagi gets a fastball about a belt high and hits it very well to right field. This is way out of here. Felix chases it, but it's way out. Bill Ripken, the hitter, and he lifts a foul out of play. Bill, one for three. Well, that is the fourth home run of the game. And David Segui, they'll try and retrieve that baseball for him. The first big league homer. Come to you, come on. Came in his 84th at bat. He has a double and a home run in this game. One and one. It's five to five. The Orioles have played this whole four game series of the Blue Jays like this. They've had big innings, they've had comebacks. These two clubs have had a fairly intense rivalry over the years, dating back to about 1983. The crowd very quiet again. That one is driven to right, but Felix will be able to handle this one. 
But the Orioles, with two down and nobody on, start a rally on a walk and then a home run. It's all tied up. Now the Budweiser storyline. And the story is that nothing's been decided. The Orioles five, the Blue Jays five. Each team has led. Each team has given up the lead. And most recently, the Toronto Blue Jays. And now, as you see, there have been four home runs hit. Segui has hit the latest one. Also, Finley of the Orioles and Gruber and Bell for the Blue Jays. And here's a new pitcher, John Mitchell. Young right hander, 25 years of age, a sinker baller. That's the storyline up till now. Mitchell on in relief for the Orioles. Well, he has 66, the 465 earned run average. He's given up more hits than innings pitched. Kenny Williams to Cal Ripken, who throws him out. What is your verdict on uh, Daniel Boone? Well, I thought he did an excellent job while he was in there because I think the Blue Jays felt like they were going to be able to put the ball game away at that time. And Boone held them close. And one swing of the bat, they're right back in the ball game. A night for Daniel Boone. Not even in professional baseball since 1984. And then to the senior league. Spotted by Bertie Tebbets. Fine year in Triple A and out tonight in the show again. Base hit for Pat Borders. Hit number 10 for the Blue Jays. The Orioles have nine. And Rance Mullenix is coming out of the dugout, the veteran. And he's going to pinch hit for Manny Lee. Tettleton out to speak with John Mitchell. The Orioles have some bullpen activity, meanwhile. There's Mullenix. Mullenix got the big hit here Friday night as a pinch hitter against Greg Olson. In the ninth inning, with two outs, he tied the ball game. Well, he's six for 17 as a pinch hitter, which means he's done a great job when they sent him up there in these situations. He doesn't have a home run, but he has five RBIs. Luis Soho, S O J O, over at first as a pinch runner for Borders, representing the possible go ahead run. And here comes Frank Robinson. Mullenix is officially entered into the game, and Frank Robinson comes out of the dugout. He's got the left hander as we understand it. Let's take a look. And there he is. That's Joe Price veteran lefty. Well I think you're going to see Frank bring in the left hander because Mullenix has hurt him already in this series. He's not going to give him another opportunity. And there goes Mitchell. One third of an inning one hit. And Price is coming in. Last of the eighth inning of the Sky Dome. The Orioles five, the Blue Jays five. A runner at first, one out. The left handed Joe Price comes on with the left handed hitter Mullenix announced as a pinch hitter. Now that Price is in, a new pinch hitter, the right handed batting, Glenn Allen Hill, will come up. Joe, uh, Joe Price has been around for a while. Well, Joe Price has a sinker and a big overhand curveball, and he throws a little slider on occasion. He's a guy that comes right after you. He's going to make you swing the bat. Well, the Blue Jays, there's one out in the inning as Hill comes up. Hill's got some power. 12 home runs this year, 255 at bats. Well, he hasn't done well as a pinch hitter. He's only one for six as a pinch hitter with no home runs and no RBI, so I don't think he likes pinch hitting. Soho, the man at first, runs pretty well. What do you think? Cito got anything up his sleeve here? Well, I don't think wait for him to hit it. Well, Glenn Allen Hill is not a guy that you want to hit and run with or do a lot of things with. He's pretty much a free swinger, so you just let him swing. Saved by Tettleton. Glenn Allen Hill has had four different minor league seasons where he struck out 150 times or more. One year, five years ago, he struck out 211 times. It's kind of hard to hit and run with a guy that doesn't make <laughs> any better contact than that. Swing and run. 
but he can hit the ball out of the ballpark. And I think he can get you an extra base hit, hit the ball in the gap, which could score a run as well. Two and one the count. There's Kurt Schilling now, right hander warming up in the Baltimore bullpen. Elrod Hendricks, former big league catcher, now the Orioles bullpen coach. Great baseball man out there with him. There's Worthington guarding the line at third base. Callum Bill Ripken double play depth and Sagi on the bag at first with Soho. Two and one the count. Soho back. Glenn Allen Hill is patient. Joe Price will give him a pitch to hit because, like I say, he will come after you. But you have to be patient. And it's through the hole. Base hit. Soho will stop at second. Well, he got one to hit. Glenn Allen Hill with his second pinch hit of the year. With a count of two and one, Joe Price is actually trying to get him to hit the ball on the ground and try to get a double play, so he throws him a sinker. But Glenn Allen Hill finds the hole. Joe Price, now he's got to face the switch hitter, Junior Felix, who will bat right handed. Felix has hit only 217 right handed, but with two thirds of his home runs batting right handed. His numbers look just like Glenn Allen Hill when he bats right handed. <laughs> a lot of homers, low average, a lot of strikeouts. This one, let's see if they get two to Bill One. Back to first. Two! Soho takes third. Junior's just too fast for him in that one. Well, it was a very close play at first base. They chop it over the mound to Ripken, to Ripken. And at first base, a very close play, but Felix beats it out. Junior Felix, they're just waiting for him to harness everything and really learn the game. He's still a very young guy, but there's not much in this game that you look for out of a, a player that he can't do. Now Mookie Wilson. They need the clutch two out hit runner at third. That is Soho. The runner at first is Felix. Another switch hitter Mookie Wilson. Blue Jays do have a lot of versatility in that regard in the roster. Tonight they started four switch hitters. I think this is a situation where you can look for Mookie maybe to even drop down a bunt because with two outs and a runner at third anything will get the run home. No. Hit it in the air. Devereaux waits for it. And we're going to the ninth inning now. The top of the order coming up for the Orioles. Finley, Anderson, and Cal Ripken. No end in sight. Tuesday, the pennant chase continues as Wade Boggs and the Boston Red Sox meet Cal Ripken and the Baltimore Orioles beginning at 7.30. Then, the second place White Sox and reliever Bobby Thickpen meet the Red Hot Oakland Athletics. That pennant chase doubleheader beginning at 7.30. That's Tuesday. Don't miss it. Now, where are we? That is a sight you don't often see in the, at a ball game. 31 stories to the top of that. Nobody's been going out and trying to hit fungos up against that either. We're in the top of the ninth, the top of the order for the Orioles, and uh, Tom Henke is in there. Finley takes a strike. Finley has walked. He's buttered into a force. He's homered and he's single. Luis Soho stays in to play second base. And the new catcher is Carlos Diaz. Hitting eighth in the order. Hankey into his windup. The one strike delivery. There's a high pop up. Soho going way out. But Felix way in. Soho wants it. And he takes it. Felix apparently never called him off. Coming right up after the ball game. Stay tuned. Sports Center. Bob Lee and Dan Patrick will have all of the highlights of the day and the various pennant races around the majors, the NFL, and an exclusive conversation with Al Davis. Here is Brady Anderson. He's hit into a force play, but stolen two bases and scored a run. He's single, he's walked, and he's popped to short. One for three. Ball one. 
Well, Joe, he played his ace card to Cito Gaston, Tom Hankey. Dwayne Ward pitched only one batter. And Hankey, uh, as you put it so well, behind hitters and he gave it up. Well, it hasn't really hurt him yet. If Hankey can go through this inning, keep the score tied, then he will have accomplished what he wanted him to do, and that was to pitch two innings. It will be up to the Blue Jays to try to score a run in the bottom of the ninth if he can hold them right here. So there's really no damage done yet. But if the Blue Jays can't score or Baltimore scores right here, then it'll be a problem. You know, you know it'll be a problem. One and two to Brady Anderson. Cito's had enough problems. The one two pitch inside two and two. Well he stayed behind the hitter so much today I mean, maybe he is a little rusty because he hasn't pitched you know for the last eight days but you know I still think that he's just missing a little bit he was going went three two on the first couple of hitters and then got him out. He's just not able to hit the spots that he wants with his fastball. Is Greg Olson, and uh, that is Kurt Schilling, the other right-hander who was up earlier on the left side of the picture. Cal Ripken coming up now. He is one for four with a run battered in. Five to five, top of the ninth. The Blue Jays have won here two straight days in the bottom of the ninth. Hit hard. Mookie got it. Line shot to center. The Blue Jays have Fernandez, Gruber, and McGriff. Bell would be due fourth. We'll see. Last of the ninth inning. And it is five to five at the Sky Dome. Sports Center coming up right after the ball game. Stay tuned. And the Blue Jays trying to give them one more highlight to fit in during their program. Here is Fernandez, then Gruber, then McGriff. Yesterday, down three to one in the last of the night. Kelly Gruber hit a three-run homer. The night before, Friday night, down seven to five in the last of the night. And the Jays got three in that one and won at eight to seven. Strike one. Uh, ball one. Yeah, it was a high fastball. I mean, look, it was over the plate, but it was high. I'm the umpire here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't argue with me. That's foul. I'm pretty sure. One ball, one strike. Fernandez has a single and a triple, but he's been weak from the right side, and he says he had the surgery in his left shoulder in the off. Uh, yeah, left shoulder in the off season. And that weak right knee that he thinks he might need surgery on this winter. Really hurt him batting right handed except right there. Look out, last of the ninth. The Orioles have had the last of the ninth inning blues this weekend in Toronto. Here comes Frank Robinson. There's Gruber coming up. Yesterday's hero. Can he do it again? Here's what he did yesterday, Joe. Well, they were trailing yesterday by two runs when he hits this home run. It was a, actually looked like the ball was out of the strike zone, but he lined it over the left field wall for a home run. And there's a reception waiting for him at home plate. They would like to do that again if they could. What an exciting moment that was. I think if you had someone other than Gruber up in this situation, you may see a bunt. But I'm not so sure they would go to the bunt with their hottest home run hitter going right now. Well, the Orioles are going to go for Greg Olson. He's not been the same Greg Olson lately. We'll talk about that in a moment. Five to five, last of the ninth, Sunday night baseball, and the Blue Jays are trying to uh, do it for the third straight day in their final at bat. Greg Olson 
the outstanding young closer of the Orioles on but uh, Joe Olson has not been the same the last uh, month or two. Well he was the guy that they beat here on Friday night and he has a great curveball but they were hitting it Friday night maybe it's not breaking quite as sharply as it was earlier in the year. He had some elbow problems and he didn't tell anybody about them. He said he'd gone about six weeks with the problem and just got so bad. He came clean about it. They sat him down for 10 days. He rested. He's just come back within the last few days. In his last nine games, in nine innings, he's allowed 11 earned runs and 16 hits. There goes the runner. And he's going to make it easy. Olsen is terrible at holding runners on. Fernandez exploits that. Uh, most breaking ball pitchers are terrible at holding runners on because they have to get the high leg kick so they can get on top of the breaking ball. And with the high leg kick, it gives the runner a lot of time to be running while he's delivering to the plate. And there was no chance for Tettleton to throw out Fernandez. I mean, it was just no contest there. Now, does Gruber get a chance to hit? Well, you've got Fred McGriff on deck. I guess the question is for Frank Robinson, not necessarily for Cito Gaskin. There's McGriff. Now a base hit could win it. That curveball is in there. One ball, one strike. I think the Blue Jays have to get this runner home psychologically because that will keep it from being a problem because Hinky came in so early because he was going to pitch through nine anyway. So if they score the run right here everything would have happened according to his plan except Hinky gets a win instead of a save. Cito Gaston may have his fingers crossed there. Gene Tennis sitting right alongside hitting instructor. Fastball is low. Two and one. I think this is a tough decision for Cito Gaston whether to bunt Fernandez over to third or let Gruber go ahead and hit. I mean, that's a tough decision. I don't think there's a right or a wrong way in this situation. It just has to go by his gut feelings. And obviously, he feels like Kelly's hot. He's going to let him swing the bat. Skydome erupted. The pitch, the curve swung out and missed. So a couple of pretty good looking hooks here to Gruber. Gruber has one sacrifice bunt for the year and that ties him for third best on the club in that category. <laughs> I guess you could say he's one of the best bunters on the team Joe. Yeah I guess you could. Nearly 50,000 at the Sky Dome. 49,886. Just barely staying alive. Well, he was looking for a curveball, and Olson went with the fastball there, a high fastball. And Gruber had a delayed swing, but he got a piece of it. And I think it's hard not to look for the breaking ball against Olson because he has such a great curveball. You almost have to look for it to hit it. Two pitch on the way. Fastball to Segui. Well, he got the run of the third. Now McGriff. Any reason? Well, they're not going to pitch to McGriff or Bell, are they? Well, I don't see why they would in this situation. Kenny Williams follows George Bell, so if he walks both McGriff and Bell. Then Kenny Williams will be the hitter with the bases loaded and one out. And they've got to bring the infield in and the outfield in. Well, you see it. Brady Anderson not coming in very far in left field. Ball one to McGriff. Pretty standard, isn't it? I mean, this situation, walk them both, fill the bases. Yeah, well, it, what it does is it gives you a force out at home plate takes away the tag having to tag the guy coming in gives you a force out it gives you a play actually at every base so if a ball's hit sharply someplace you may be able to turn a double play by tagging a bag and forcing a guy at the, at the base behind him but 
can also cause a problem because if he walks up here with the bases loaded, there's no margin for error for Greg Olson. If he gets behind in the count, then he has to come with the fastball. Ball four to McGriff. The NFL game, by the way, is over. Pittsburgh defeated Houston. And uh, for those of you who've been watching that, we welcome you here to the Sky Dome in Toronto. It is five to five in the last of the ninth inning. And the Blue Jays had the possible winning run over at third base and one out. Now, the Orioles will make a defensive change. Jeff McKnight is going into left field. Brady Anderson, they kept signaling and signaling and signaling, and he never moved in. Well, I can see that. He's still pretty deep, but now they're going to move Anderson into center field, so Devereaux is the guy that looks like is coming out of the ball game. It was McKnight who made that throw yesterday from right field that almost caught Mookie Wilson at third base. Now Frank Robinson is going to go out. Well the reason he's going out is he had not signaled for Greg Olson to walk George Bell and maybe he doesn't want him to walk George Bell and Greg Olson is saying well I don't know this is what Frank's saying well what's going on. He wants him to go after George Bell and I think Greg Olson wants to walk George Bell so he can pitch to Kenny Williams with the bases loaded and have a force at each base. And I don't think he'd pitch to Kenny Williams. He'd have to face John Olerud. Well, that's probably true, too. And that's probably what Frank is thinking about. Olerud is a left-handed hitter. And Friday night, as a pinch hitter, in the ninth inning, Olerud against Olson singled home the winning run. There's Olerud, and he's all set to go. Well, that is obviously what Frank Robinson is thinking. Because they're going to pitch to George Bell. That's a tough decision, isn't it? Well, I, I don't think it is in this case because if they walk the bases loaded, and like I said, puts a lot of pressure on Olsen to get a strike on the first pitch. So they're going for the double play. The Ripkins are double play depth at shortstop and second. The outfield is pulled in. You see the infield there. They're both in about halfway. And here's Bell, the great RBI man. Ball one. But I think that was a purpose pitch right there. He wanted to throw his fastball as hard as he could inside to try to set him up for the breaking ball. See, he has some leeway here because the bases aren't loaded. And if he happens to walk Bell, it won't really kill him. Ball two. But see, if he were to walk the bases loaded and miss with the first pitch, he'd be in a lot of trouble right now. And I think that's what Frank was thinking. So instead of walking the bases loaded and putting your pitcher under that kind of pressure, you give him a shot at the right-handed hitting George Bell. And he will chase a pitch, but not right now. It's a strike on the outside. Whoa. Two and one. Olsen's not arguing. Fernandez the possible winning run is over at third base Bell trying to figure out how to get him home. The Blue Jays have won it again. It'll be a force play. He won't get credit for a base hit because McGriff did not run. But Bell has driven in the winning run on a force out. The Blue Jays in the bottom of the ninth inning are a winner for the third straight day over the Orioles and now they are just one game back of the Boston Red Sox. Big finish. Well, I, I think again, George Brell is is a guy that knows how to hit in all kind of situations. He was sitting on the breaking ball, but he handled a fastball and got it over to the infielder's head. Olson actually, you know, Friday night he got beat on all breaking balls. This time, really, the fastball is what hurts him. It was a good pitch up and in. wasn't much George Bell could do with it, but he's strong enough to muscle it over the infield, and that's a base hit. McGriff could not run simply because. You know, if the second baseman makes the catch, it's a double play. So you give up the one run, keep George from getting an R, uh, L, a base hit, but you still get the runner home. And Finley did throw it to second to get the force play, so no base hit there, but they'll take the win. I don't think they really care about whether it was a base <laughs> hit or a force out or what. 
So there it is. Up to the moment. The Toronto Blue Jays, who what, 11 days ago, were six and a half back of Boston. Now just one game out. They have won nine of their last 11. The Yankees are coming here. Boston is going to Baltimore. And on Tuesday, you'll be able to see that one, the second game of that series, the Red Sox and the Orioles. First half of a doubleheader beginning at 7.30. The second half, the White Sox and the Athletics. We'll see you next Sunday afternoon from Pittsburgh. Cardinals and the Pirates, John Miller. For Joe Morgan, the Blue Jays have won it. Good night. <laughs>